Good evening and welcome to the Select Board meeting of October 15th, 2018. I'm calling the meeting in order at 6.35 p.m. Uh, we'll start with our uh, opening remarks, announcements, and agenda review. A um, couple of items I'll mention here right off the bat uh, to my colleagues. Uh, under action and discussion items number four, shade tree, uh, four E, shade tree regulations. I don't think we're gonna adopt them this evening. I think there's some things we need to correct on that a little bit more, but we will have a little bit of a brief discussion about it if there's things you wanna mention, so we make sure to get that folded in. But I will will say we will probably not actually adopt them tonight just by virtue of some uh, final adjustments that are necessary. Um, I think that as far as order of events, um, We'll start with public comment. Is is anyone here for public comment other than for an item on the agenda? I don't believe so. Um, so I think we'll take up the personnel board first, but then uh, I'm noticing that we have one of our licenses folks here, so we may take that up as our second item before we go back into our action and discussion items. Is there anything anyone else needs to announce here at the beginning? So our first item of business is under action and discussion items. Um, is the personal board recommendation part-time employees wage increase, Mr. Steinberg? Yes, um, as uh, I've announced before, my wife is a uh, part-time hourly employee of the library system working at the North Amherst Library. Um, there is a notice on file with the town clerk regarding the uh, conflict of interest having to do with the ethics advice received from the ethics commission and further advice received from the Ethics Commission. I'm going to uh, absent myself from the meeting during this discussion and vote. Thank you. So, so I believe we have Ms. Radway and Mr. Butterfield here to walk us through the, the uh, recommendation. So if you join us here, identify yourself as the microphone. Not that I didn't just do that, but you can do that again for us. Good evening, I'm Tony Butterfield, currently the chair of the personnel board. And this is my dear friend and colleague, <laughs> whom you know well. Deborah Radway, Director <laughs> of Human Resources and Human Rights. So on behalf of my colleagues on the personnel board, none of whom could be here tonight, and one of whom I think is at a different meeting in town hall even as we speak, but I'd like uh, them to be uh, identified as well, Charlie Sherpa, Rebecca Woodland, Chris Hoffman, and Catherine Porter. Catherine is the one who's in a different meeting going on right now. We are pleased to present to you a recommended uh, wage and salary schedule for the town's part-time employees to take effect on January 1st, 2019. This action is needed because on that date there is a new statewide law that the minimum wage shall be $12 an hour. And although technically that law does not apply to municipalities, the select board has always had the policy of, well, if we're asking our businesses to do this, we ought to do the same. So in prior years, we have also made adjustments to be in compliance with the state minimum wage law. So on January 1st, uh, the new minimum wage will be $12 an hour, and that is actually the first action that will occur over the next four years, uh, ending up with a minimum wage of $15 an hour in 2015. After this January, it goes up 75 cents an hour each of the remaining years until 2023. Thanks to the work of Ms. Radway and colleagues in payroll and finance, uh, we have come up with the best way to achieve this new minimum wage without throwing the entire uh, wage structure out of whack due to the problem that you are all familiar with, namely wage compression. We could easily just have only the bottom level get, 20, uh, get $12 an hour and then that would soon create problems with the other levels and steps. So the way we are re recommending that this be done is to have a 2% cost of living increase for all of the part-time employees. They did not receive one last uh, July 1st when the full-time employees did. And then look at what that did to the wages in each of the positions and levels. Uh, and it turned out there were three that were not 
quite at the $12 an hour, so those were adjusted to that level manually. And you have before you on the back side of the uh, memo, I think, what that new wage structure would be. This, of course, does come at a cost. And folks have figured out what that cost will be for 2019, assuming that the same number of part-time hours is worked next year as has been worked uh, this year. And so the total cost of the adjustments we are recommending comes to $26,000. We are also recommending <clears throat> that managers in the future, in the immediate future, as they do their budget planning, bake in a COLA increase for their part-time employees. This has not always been uh, a practice but we think it should be, particularly to keep the differences among the, uh, the levels and the steps uh, in sync. So I think I'll stop there and see what the questions are, and maybe Ms. Radway can correct any of the mistakes that I'm sure I've made. Are there any questions from the board for Mr. Butterfield or Ms. Radway? Yes. My question is more for the town manager, but maybe it'll spark something else. And that is, um, I appreciate the details that you put in writing ahead of time. Thank you very much. It was great to be able to review this over the weekend. And one of the things you had indicated is talking with the department recommendation to the town manager that department heads would budget for these to yes. make sure this is clear. And one of the things I'm a little concerned about is that we have had this sort of difficulty in the past associated with when something happens, it makes it look like a particular budget area is going up a lot, like they're suddenly doing something, and that yes, they would be paying their employees more, which is a good thing. But in terms of the expectation that each department is looking at in terms of expenditures, I'm a little concerned about the pressure it might put on departments like mostly LSSC yeah. and elections in terms of other things they want to do. and but because we're telling them they need to raise the wages, that that's going to make, I mean, obviously there are trade-offs in budgeting all the time, but there are particular departments that are going to be much more heavily impacted than others. So I'm just wondering what your sense of is for that. So uh, we've discussed this with all the, the most uh, impacted department heads, both all the department heads, in fact, so everybody's aware of, of this. Um, everybody feels that they can continue to accomplish their mission with the recognition that there will be a slightly higher wage for uh, these part-time employees. It does have an impact on LSSC and in the library in particular. Um, it is something we will address during the budget process for FY20 when we go through that process. Ms. Kruger. both comments so kind of um, along that same vein uh, the third bullet point in as uh, mr. Butterfield um, spoke about um, it's the personnel board's recommendation to the town manager that department heads be encouraged to budget and I'm I'm just not sure what encourage I mean wouldn't it be instructed to budget um, yeah, understanding as Ms. Brewer pointed out there's certainly tensions within all of our department's budgets but um, it, I just was like, what does it mean, encourage to budget? Maybe we could, what does that mean? <laughs> or are they going to budget for it? Yeah, I think, I think the personnel board felt it was not within their purview to direct. Um, and so, <laughs> so that's only, that's in your purview. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I think that's why they use the word encourage. And I think that they recognize that the sort of tension that gets developed that you identified with the department heads when on the departments that are especially impacted by this is saying like we're doing we're doing we have to do the same amount with less money in essence because we're paying people at a higher rate um so i think that that's that was the intent of that and i think what they're saying is they were listening to the department heads say to them wow this is, impacts us operationally and that's why they were saying you should budget for this because it's going to be coming it's not going to be a one-off it's going to be we know it's going to be happening every year for the next four years so, and yes. we, we've taken that to heart, yes. I guess when we make, you know, take our position, it, it, it gets a little firmer than cheering them on to do so. <laughs> um, and then my second thing is just, just a comment, um, because this may be the last chance that I um, 
see Mr. Butterfield in a, in a public setting, and I, I just wanted to say as the liaison to the personnel um, board that I have um, really enjoyed working with that group, Ms. Radway is the staff, um, and um, it's, just, it, it's just a really good group of people to do their work um, with a lot of integrity and um, very focused on the well-being of the employees in the town and have a kind of big picture view and particularly Mr. Butterfield has led the group I think since um, since I've been attending which has been four plus years so I just want to have a chance to say publicly how much I am an admirer of the work actually that both of you do but uh, to you Tony you've just been um, a great chair for this group so well, thank you thank you and it's a good group and Ms. Radway is a fabulous resource for the group and we enjoy you know, working for the town on the behalf of the town and its citizens and especially the wonderful employees that we have. <laughs> so right back at you. We're glad to have you be the liaison. Thank you. Thank you Tom. Other questions or comments? Ms. Brewer. I've gotten a little confused. I'm rereading the, the motion and talking about what we know for the next four years and talking about what's going to be recommended to the council and what's recommended to us. What are we actually <coughs> making happen with this versus the personnel board approaching the council in the future for future increases? What's our structure here? I believe that the personnel board's recommendation is to the select board right now to adopt the $12 uh, an hour minimum wage and the salary schedule that is before you. In subsequent years, it will be, I presume, up to the council to decide how it wants to progress towards that $15 an hour um, number in 2023 or at any point before that um, as it deems appropriate we just didn't want to reach further than what is required for January 1st at this time and we also wanted to get this set up I don't know when the first meeting of the new town council will be but this something needs to happen on January 1st and I'm sure there's going to be a huge list of things that they need attending to and it's really almost imperative that we do this, so we thought we should just, with your agreeing to this, uh, to this action, to have one thing taken care of that is in place for the coming year, and then as things get rolling and we get closer to the end of next uh, year, that council can address the, the issue of what to do about the 75 cents an hour increase that will be mandated uh, July, uh, June, uh, January 1. 2020. So still a little confused. The <clears throat> motion ends with to raise the minimum wage rate paid to all employees to a minimum of $12 per hour when? Because that's... Well, it says effective uh, January 1. So, I'm not sure so that's back to <clears throat> the... That, well, that's the salary schedule that provides a 2%. Because the way it's phrased, it makes it sound like the second part's outside of the salary schedule. The but it's all part of the same thing so it's not additionally it's the raising the minimum wage rate to a minimum of twelve dollars per hour is part of the salary schedule for part-time hourly employees that's effective 1 1 2019 mm -hmm. it's not an additional thing so I would really rather drop the word additional there because it includes raising right. the minimum wage rate salary schedule. the salary schedule effective 1 1 includes would you like to make that motion uh, no, I'd like Mr. Bachelman to revise it so oh, it actually no, makes make sense. The motion revised. Yes, that provides an across the board to, and and raises the minimum. Maybe it's just and raises. Yeah. yeah it's just instead of additionally and two, mm -hmm. it's yeah. and raises the minimum wage mm -hmm. rate paid to all employees to a minimum of twelve dollars per hour because that makes it clear that it reflects back to the one one nineteen date. Second. So just to be clear, we deleted the word additionally to, the words additionally to and added S to raise. Correct. That's Otherwise, what I've got. Right. Yeah. Got it. So that was a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? 
Hearing none, all those in favor, please say wait, aye. Wait, 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 before wait. We do. So I think the point about the timing of this is, is worth just to spend a minute. Um, yes. Because we've, almost every action that we've taken over the last couple months, we've at least paused to th be thoughtful about whether we should be doing this now or whether this should wait. And I, I certainly understand the perspective you shared about why you're doing it now, but I think for us to at least take that, take a pause on. Um, I, I guess, like many things, this is somewhat of a gray area. I'm not uncomfortable taking this action because it follows past policy and um, it deals with an issue we, we've been well versed in and followed for quite a while. We could say, oh, put that on the list for council and then they would have to get um, the background. I, I think the $26,000 is um, probably a very diminuous, diminuous amount, but not not necessarily nothing, not to sneeze at. But um, the overall percentage of the town's budget <coughs> or the salary line for town employees, it's it's probably very small, and we don't um, we have not been taking a lot of actions where we spent a lot of money. So I, I think um, it's in some ways more housekeeping, and and I would be comfortable, but I'd I'd like to make sure that the other members feel comfortable taking this action at this at this time. Well, I would suggest that I'm comfortable as well, I think, for a couple of reasons. One is that what we run into, unfortunately, with the minimum wage law is that it changes in January, and yet our fiscal year runs July 1 to July 1 to June 30th. And so we're always kind of struggling, should we do this on a fiscal year basis or, if, you know, more in timeliness right. with, the, right. with the other. And I think if, you know, we've taken this action again this time of year in years past, so I don't think it's a deviation from past practice. Um, and again, I think it's, you know, it is worth considering, but I also am comfortable with taking this action at this point, because I, I would hate for it to sit for six months and then have the council do it as part of their, they may want to anticipate it for their next budget for fiscal 20, but um, certainly in, in, the, uh, in the current fiscal year, I think it's fine to do that. Mr. Wall? I'm, I'm so comfortable with this. I don't even see the need to discuss it. I think it's a waste of time. <laughs> I mean, I think the reason you've stated, both of you indicate why it's not a gray area. It's the right thing to do. It's in conformity with state policy, even though we're not fully obligated to do that, and we've been doing it before, so let's move on. Ms. Brewer. Despite what Mr. Wall just said, <laughs> I would really encourage us to, and when I say us, this is the royal us, which means not me, um, that we issue a press release after we do this, assuming that this passes, that touches on the fact that it's a one-year action, that we've not fully committed to the future schedule, although I might like to commit us to that. Um, that's not what we're doing because of the very transition provision that we're talking about. The fact that we are looking at the minimum wage as an employer of choice, even though we're not required to do it, because that was something that certainly surprised a number of people in town when they realized we weren't actually subject to it when they voted to change it statewide. And also the um, mention, I think we deserve credit for the mention of the sick and personal leave that we provide our regular part-time employees. I think all of these things are things that we should mention to the public that we are doing on their behalf and that we think are good things. And again, we're not totally tying up the council for the future, but these are areas of recognition that I think we don't always get full credit for. <coughs> Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 So that's unanimous with one absent. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. And so if you see Mr. Steinberg in the <laughs> hallway, if you would. <laughs> oh, he's, he's, he's ready. He knows. listening he's in. He's watching so. on TV. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think for the sake of, of courtesy, I, I see our uh, the folks from Jake's are here to uh, have a change in their common victual license. So, if you gentlemen would like to come to the to the um, to the front and uh, tell us a little bit about that, and we'll we'll take up that topic under our licenses and public way and meter parking reservation. Thank you for uh, <coughs> seeing us, and nice to see you all. Hello. Again. Practically regulars here. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're <laughs> <popular>. <laughs> These are here as often as we are. So. True. May not um, be the best thing. Once again, thank you for having us. Um, we are here tonight um, to request a change in of our hours of operation. 
of our restaurant from 7 a.m. until 1 a.m. Um, the reason for this, I had drafted a letter to the board uh, explaining the reasons. Um, simply, we're not seeing the revenue stream that we really need to in order to sustain our business. So we'd like options um, in order to host private events and um, uh, various other parties in order to right to get to the, the revenue stream that we that we yeah. need um, and be, have that flexibility with the um, with the expanded hours. Yeah. Does the board have questions? I'm trying to locate my guess. So, having asked questions about this at agenda setting, I want to make draw the board's attention to my understanding here, which is that the ZBA just last week, and we got this memo on our desk tonight, approved the class two restaurant for Jake's and allowed them to stay open until 1 a.m. They talked about conditions associated with alcohol storage, but they of course do not issue the alcohol license, and we made it incredibly clear at our last meeting that we were not putting alcohol hours any longer than what was originally applied for. It's my understanding that the alcohol license is in process, which means a couple of things, which is one, it can't be changed while it's in process. Two, we would need another hearing, as we indicated then, for additional hours. And three, that there can be no ability to get a one-day liquor license in the meantime to cover any events that might happen. So it's in kind of this um, odd space in terms of what happens. So I just want to make sure we're all clear that that's our understanding of this and that I'm totally willing to extend the hours of operation for Common Vic that I have no problem with ZBA. Normally we would do that either before or after ZBA, they do it before or after us, and that's been taken care of at the ZBA level. But in terms of the alcohol license, that is going to be a separate issue beyond the seven to three, which I know is going to seem strange to some customers who are going to come in and say, wait, I can have a Bloody Mary at lunch, but I can't have a glass of wine with dinner. And the answer is that is correct. Yes. It is a bit of a quirk of where you're at licensing wise. Yeah, so um, I did bring this up with the uh, planning commission licensing, uh, spoke with Jennifer, spoke with everybody in the departments in order to figure out the best course of action. <laughs> and um, they said going for the ZBA and asking for it. Um, <clears throat> and then asking here for the extended hours while the liquor license was in process. Um, the language put into whatever board would kind of allow the approvals to go forward no matter who we sat before first. So that being said, um, I was just aware of that we had to go through this process and yeah. Yeah, I think the difficulty is just the, 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 the alcohol license itself is going to be not quite, it's, you have to, the one you've got in process now with the ABCC has got to kind of finish going through the, the sausage grinder, as it were, yeah. and then you can seek an amendment to that at that point, but it does um, sort of create this gap of time where your alcohol license is a much smaller window of time than your actual Victor license. license. Um, right. Right. Anyway, so yes. So did we decide when we were speaking about this at agenda setting and you know getting all this set up, did we speak about the idea of going ahead and posting, uh, uh, legally advertising, not posting, legally advertising another hearing? Or because ABCC's process is unpredictable, it's a little difficult to do that. I think we were of the latter, but I'm not sure. that we haven't yet scheduled because we don't know <coughs> quickly. Right. right. Yeah, if, if ABCC was more precise in its process, then we might be able to sort of, of course, put some things on a calendar. Of course, yeah, right yeah, yeah, that makes sense, yeah, absolutely. So is there other comment or question relative to this change to the common victor or license? And if not, if someone wanted to offer a motion, I'll offer the motion. <clears throat> um, I move to approve the change in the common vigiler license hours of operation to 7 a.m. to 1 a.m. the following day, Monday through Sunday, for Jake's at the Mill, 68 Coles Road, Chris Ware and Alexander Rosh, owners, managers. So 
motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Yes. Um, well, I was glad to see um, the letter from the ZBA, which is in my materials, and I saw it, and it disappeared. In my, it got sucked into my packet. But um, I was glad to see that because the notes I had made when I reviewed um, our earlier packet was I w the concern that um, the extended um, hours would have a lot more impact potentially on the neighborhood, but if the ZBA has already looked at that and considered that, then um, I'm, I'm happy with what we're doing. And as Ms. Brewer pointed out, we're not extending the alcohol hours yet because we can't, but that's where the direction we're going. And it, and it does say <clears throat> in the letter from uh, Mr. Ware and Mr. Washard that just, we feel that the noise level will be kept to a reasonable level. And I was just like, not sure what one person's reasonable <laughs> level, another person's whatever, but um, this is really a ZBA issue for the special permit for the restaurant and not ours, but so I'm comfortable with our part of the action, but to just acknowledge that having a place serving alcohol and staying open much later is a different kind of um, business model than what we had looked at previously. Thank you, just following up on that. So exactly, and so once their license comes in from ABCC that we agreed to during those hours, so they may well start serving dinner as you know, soon as this happens because ZBA decision and our common VIC. But in terms of then, you know, the alcohol license will come through, they can start serving as we agreed, and then there's going to be a gap of time because we will want the neighbors to have another chance beyond the fact that legally we need to do it. We will want the neighbors to have another chance because it does set not in any way possibly a negative tone, but it is a different scenario um, with the housing that is nearby there to have it at dinner time and later than it was seemed much simpler associated with breakfast and lunch. So I hope that we can, um, with all the bazillions of things staff is keeping track of, keep track of when that comes in and try and get a hearing legally noticed as quickly as possible after that. But I don't know if we're gonna make it in time for the select board to take action on that. And then it falls into the gray area of the licensing commission and the town manager. So it would be, I would think it would be far preferable to try and get it done if we possibly could in November here assuming ABCC cooperates by not right. sitting on it for several weeks. Okay. Mr. Wall? I mean, I certainly appreciate <clears throat> the need for due diligence and licensing establishments such as this and with a change in uh, their functions and hours. But, you know, it's a little bit ironic that we're supposedly encouraging development in town, this part of town, in a former commercial area with mixed use and retail, and then worried about the noise impact of a rather sedate restaurant that serves a limited amount of alcohol when you have a very active pub and bar down the street and you're putting in new housing with several hundred residents and retail, which may contain other drinking and eating establishments, too. So, I mean, it's good, good to be cautious, but I hope that uh, the response of the public is, is welcoming to the business that they're trying to revive this part of North Amherst and make it a, a lively place. And I don't think disruption is a great danger to this part of town. So we do have a motion in, in front of us here. Uh, is there further discussion on that? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for all your help in this new process for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope we get to see you a few more times before we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, at least exactly. Once. <laughs> all right. Thank you both. So we'll head back to our action and discussion items. Uh, next on our agenda is the North Common Renovations Main Street parking lot and a timeline. So I believe we have a memo here to take us through a little bit. Mr. Bachman? Yes. Um, Ms. Brestrup? Ms. Brestrup is not going to be here tonight. No, no. Um, Her memo, though. So uh, in your packet, which I'm trying to locate my copy, uh, is a memo from Ms. Brestrup. Absolutely. Um, which outlines, gives a ba basic history of the project of the North Common Main Street, why it, it merged into one uh, comprehensive project, uh, where the money came from um, to, to initiate the process, and where we are. So um, to summarize it, there have been two public, hearing, two public meetings uh, during the summer, during the spring and the summer. Um, 
in September, there were three concepts that were reviewed with the select board. Next week, uh, the, uh, we will again review a final concept plan uh, with the select board, uh, mostly to sort of, uh, since you have been involved in this whole process from the very beginning, to get your sense of things and whether we're, in the, we're moving in the right direction or not, and to make sure the public is fully engaged in the entire planning process. Even though there have been public meetings on this, and many people have attended the public meetings, uh, you can never do outreach too much uh, for some, something that's as critical as this. Um, the, we're anticipating that this will again be presented to the town council. We, would, uh, we have established a fairly aggressive timeline, so we would early on in the council's existence, we would present it to the council in January uh, and review, review with them, them what, what the concept was. Um, we, if, the, if they approve the concept, we would then go into permitting and final design and do the final bids in March. Uh, and hopefully we would do the construction award in late April because we would like to begin this project. We, I, we are, I'm really hoping that we don't have to delay this project another year. The only time that we can do this project is once graduation occurs and take, take, take over the summer because that's the least impact on the businesses and the residents in town. So we would move from uh, mid-May until um, potentially as late as November to do the construction of the entire thing. Uh, we would phase it so that we could uh, use one section as a staging area and have, try to stage it so we could lose as few parking spaces as possible during the construction period. So I think the goal tonight was just to alert you to what the time frame was, um, what the select board's role was, and uh, to alert the public about the uh, more comprehensive conversation that's going to happen next, work, next uh, Monday on October 22nd. And there are also some letters from people that we've received over time in, in your packet as well. Other questions for the manager relative to the, to the timeline or topics? Yes, Mr. Yeah, re <clears throat> regarding the timeline, there are a number of major events that occur routinely on an annual basis in the common, starting with the fair, the um, Big Brothers, Big Sisters Art Fair, the uh, <coughs> um, Bids uh, or Chamber of Commerce uh, first, you know, the night out for uh, the restaurants. Is uh, the plan sufficient to protect those events and allow the events to go forward? So the the uh, entire area that would be under construction is the North Common and the Main Street parking lot, so it would not extend beyond the Spring Street. Uh, parking lot. So those air, those events all occur on the South Common. So those events should all be able to continue as planned. What won't be in existence will be that sort of breathing area, which is the North Common. But that doesn't really get impacted that much by these events anyway. Um, and then also the parking lot, uh, the Main Street parking lot. Those parking spaces will be out of commission. And I assume the same thing is true for the farmers market. Farmers Market is another question. We, that's something we have not addressed, but it is something um, they could, they would stay, if they want to stay where they are, they could. Um, but we, if they were interested in moving someplace else during the, the construction period, we could talk to them about that. But you're planning at this point to allow for that and assuming that the, we get closer on the timeline, we could start telling them, uh, we could start telling all those typical organizations, which we know we always see because you get the common applications anyway, um, and that continues under the new form of government. So you can start telling people like the Taste and the Big Brothers, Big Sisters, et cetera, that they will, won't have that parking available to them in any fashion, but that, as you say, the rest of the, the part they actually are using per se, um, will be fine right. and will not be impacted. Right. So it's just people coming to, and occasionally sometimes they use vendor parking directly in front of town hall. I had just a, a comment and a question. In terms of um, just phrasing for the public's benefit, mm -hmm. on the second page under current progress, one, two, three, four, five paragraphs down, 
One thing I think that, that we want to be cautious about as we continue to describe things, and I really appreciate this memo, which I had asked for, and I do appreciate that it even has lots of text with it, not just dates, so thank you, is that it says here, verbatim, since August, town staff has met separately with the select board, the Disability Access Advisory Committee, the Downtown Parking Working Group, and various other stakeholders. When you don't say at public meetings, it makes people imagine, people who already suspect things of staff and committees, that things are happening behind closed doors. And I know that's not true, because we were here, and they were here. And so I would just encourage, you don't rewrite a memo, but in terms of moving forward, that when you say that staff has been meeting with boards or meeting with stakeholders, anything that's public associated with that, I think is worth mentioning. You don't have to list all the dates, but just to make it super clear, because otherwise it might sound like they met from with the select board chair and maybe one member, as opposed to, they came here, they were on television, the press could have written about it. It was something that was completely open and exposed to the light, as they say. And so that's simply a stylistic issue, but I think that it's important, particularly as things are changing, that we make it really clear that staff is actually going to all these public meetings. It's not that they get to just decide things internally. They're working really hard to reach out to all the necessary bodies. And the other action that I'm just a little confused by, and I think it's just a matter of language, but it could be partly the transition. On the actual timeline, when it says late February, it says permitting. And since this is written by a planner, I understand that, but it says design review board and town council. Town council doesn't do any permitting. So what are they referring to exactly? Accepting the final design or are they referring to the to the funding because the funding's not mentioned here any place in terms of the town council accepting the bond. Mm -hmm. So like I said a planner wrote this, I get that. But um, in terms of maybe the next time we see this timeline, it could be a little tweaked to be clearer on it's, it's a good start, it's a really good start, and it really lays out what we needed to know about construction, because I know that everybody was concerned about that, especially when I was encouraging us not to act. So I appreciate that we're moving things along, but it needs to be clearer when town council has to act on both the, I know it says January 2019, approval for final concept plan, so that would be one town council action but another town council action would be the bond authorization. And I think that's what we're actually looking at there, whereas Design Review Board may well have permitting authority, that, but, but they have recommendation. And so just permitting, I think, is probably just the wrong word. Mm -hmm. And it just needs to clarify what the roles of those bodies are. Mr. Crew, Mr. Wall? Oh, Mr. Wall. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a, it's a good point to take into account the public's <coughs> reading of things. I guess I was reading it differently because it said select board as a body, and we wouldn't be meeting as a body without an open law, open meeting law violation anyway, but never can be too careful. Um, I guess I had a question about the draft final concept plan referred to here. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And where the public will find that. Uh, hopefully it'll be in your packet on Thursday or Friday when we post your packet for next week. Is that is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, the one you have to be talking about. This the one we're going to talk about on the 22nd. Because oh, the date is oh, yeah, unclear this. because we have a sketch of a preferred. There is concept, a sketch. Yeah, and there's a reference to a final concept that's not a plan. It's kind of, near it. it's kind of tiny. I don't know. Yeah, is that the official final. I don't preferred plan. Believe uh, it. No, because uh, oh. they hadn't had enough time. Right. I know they were meeting this yet. afternoon. So and this was in your packet before this afternoon. So I know there's a meeting. Not of this. Final. It's, yeah. this is on the way to being more final. Yeah. Right. Because that was a little bit confusing. And we saw it last time we had the three plans. And I mean, I guess I would like to also, it's too bad Ms. Brestrup isn't here to answer questions because I'd like to know more about, I'm sure with her next week, about the process, how they got from here to there. Yeah. Because it seemed they had the one that was ambitious and idealistic and one that was awful. And as usual, they picked the messy compromise that was entirely unimaginative. And uh, I would like to hear more about how they got from the one to the other mm -hmm. and what the logic of that was. You know, because again, if it was, we were we had this public these public meetings. We had the presentation of select board a few weeks ago. Seems like ages ago by now. Mm -hmm. And then there was sort of this sense that well, one wasn't good and one was too bold. So it's through some sort of magical consensus, this preferred this you know plan, second plan became the the sole survivor. And I, I guess I would be interested in. in what how we got there. How, why this is labeled the preferred concept here when we yep. don't, don't know the rest of the process. Agreed. Yeah. 
I guess my comments are, are similar in that I'm, you know, I, I didn't know this is still under consideration. Um, so I, I realize it's the middle kind of some parking, not as much parking. This shows a minus eight spaces. Um, but there's certainly, and maybe it's not the final, and we'll get more detail, but I had a couple of questions, like where it says drop-off area, which I know it's, it's important for people to be able to access town hall, and it's, it's, but it's pretty hard to see in this, at this scale or this version what, how that actually works. And then um, shaded Bosque Plaza, maybe Mr. Wall, do you know what that is? But I don't have a clue what that is. Um, so maybe... I think it's a reference to a plaza in another country. I'm trying to Google it quickly while here, but I'm not sure. But maybe, and then um, the one thing. Well, well, I had spoken of not wanting to lose all the parking, um, and being very protective of the parking. So in that regard, this is close to it's a minus eight. Um, but I've also spoken. Um, we've been looking at this one way or another for um, like well over a year. Um, I don't see anything here that addresses a place for children to climb on something or do something like the area at Pulaski Park, and I really hope that's going to come in the final version that we, clearly this isn't the final, which is good, because um, there's, there's some, some things that I think are really missing from this. So um, I'm not going to let that point go. I realize we haven't voted on that particular area, but I am also having also, well, beyond, we've all been parents at some point, but also I have uh, was listening to that, those comments made at uh, one of the public meetings and continue. And so I want to make it really, really clear to staff as they're talking with Weston and Sampson that it doesn't matter that five people didn't say it. It matters that we're saying it because you're not going to get it approved if it doesn't, if it doesn't get addressed or at least at least two of us believe that's true at this point. So the fact that a number of people at a public meeting said, let's just get rid of all the parking, that was great and interesting and valuable, but it is not the final decisive factor and does not over outweigh some of the concerns that we are also bringing to this, since we are at this point the next level of deciding. The other thing I would ask is that we have a drawing and it can be very basic and it can be based on our parking maps. It would, does not need to be some brand new convoluted thing of what our current conditions are here. So just in terms of like showing people, look, these are where the spaces are right now here and in front of town hall and, in, and, and going down Boltwood. And this is what we're talking about doing instead because this is pretty, but it's not useful for making a decision. We need more detail than this in terms of making a decision. It's, it, it, yeah, and it's lovely to use planning terms like a Bosque, but it's not <laughs> particularly helpful to the public, and it doesn't tell me anywhere near enough to know what this actually means in terms of parking. So like I said, our basic parking maps with the little dots on them that staff have worked with a while would go a long way to showing what current conditions are and then something that's perhaps on a bigger piece of paper, perhaps in a different format, um, would be incredibly helpful because Having it not be helpful doesn't mean it'll just get done. Even though we're frustrated with the map, it may mean that it gets delayed another meeting. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point that Ms. Brewer raises. I, I mean, I did, I've kind of counted spaces on here on the map, and I looked at, I looked most of the totals, and I have a sense of where things are. As I recall, the, the, the PowerPoint presentation had a lot of these you know, existing conditions and so forth, including maps, but it's a good reminder that the public should be given those too, or we should. Sure. And if, if, we're, if we're being direct, as far as you know, the, the people playing, I guess I assume the kids were going to climb on the cars you all seem to want to have there. <laughs> but um, I'm glad Ms. Kruger and Ms. Brewer raised the question of the play structures and things like that too, because I think there's a chance since parking is so contentious, and I can say that I want to have to walk three blocks tonight to find a spot. Um, you know, since parking is so contentious, I don't want us to forget the landscape issues because there were significant differences in the landscape plans of the three. And again, I'd like to know how we got from here to there. I think each had strengths and weaknesses. They were oriented for different, I mean, taking into account the topography, they're oriented for different types of activity, you know, public activity, seating areas, and so forth. So we don't want to overlook the, the landscape in the, in the process of that. And if we can, I don't know, we've had questions to planning board and planning department, or are we just, 
talking to ourselves here? Or? Uh, yes, so they'll pass these along. Yes, of course. I, I guess the other question I had is, was, was there a serious consideration? I mean, because part of the problem is, I mean, I think this is in, you know, it's, it's some ways it's a plan everyone can live with. Um, and I totally understand the need for more parking downtown. I've always understood that too. I mean, my fear is that this is not the way to solve it because it's the worst of both worlds in that it makes us think that we've preserved parking or haven't hurt parking. So it doesn't increase parking and it doesn't put it in the right place. And when people in 100 years look, look, look at this, they're gonna say, what were you thinking? Uh, taking this iconic space in front of town hall and keeping parking there with a chance to redesign something different. But I guess, you know, given that we need parking, I guess I would like to know how thoroughly we considered other options. Like, I'm not an engineer. You know, people talked though in these previous sessions about increased diagonal parking alongside on, on Pleasant Street and so forth, you know. If you, because we're taking chunks out of things here and there anyway, and we're closing off a street that's now two way and losing some spaces there, you know, what could one do in other ways that would keep the green space and public meeting space here and provide parking? But, um, you know, bottom line, parking problem is not solved by this and it's not going away, so. so the other thing I would mention, just since we're <clears throat> getting ahead of ourselves in some ways, because this was about timeline, but, but, um, get to get it but, it, but if we can get these, you know, sort mm -hmm. of to be, for, get the, um, uh, planning department be prepared to answer mm -hmm. those because they're going to come up. The other thing that I didn't see, although it may be there, is um, where the bike share rack goes. Because mm -hmm. um, we uh. intentionally put it where we put it, and you know, in the redesign, it may not fit quite like we want it to. Mm -hmm. Or it, it plays into the aesthetic that you're trying to create there. So that would be something that we should think about how it fits into mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, like, yep. It's the best. It's not a, it's yeah, not it's tiny. Size. It's, a, it it's a, good a good size thing. And it may kind of be there. Drop but off. It bus stop like is bus, wrong. But it's labeled drop bus off no. bus stop. It's it says improve streetscape and drop off it's just not bus shown. stop. Not yeah. 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 So anyway, we need a just, clearer bus stop right. and bike rack. Right. Yeah. And obviously, when we get this on a little larger scale, we'll be able to see more things and complain more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll complain but nonetheless, I mean, you know, see. it is it is one of those things that we did, you know, go to considerable effort to, to mm -hmm. put in place and yep that is a significant newer feature of the of the existing comments so mm -hmm. anyway um, are there other comments relative to this that we want to share with the manager to share out with planning staff relative to this but I think telling that story of sort of how we got to here and what are the what are the trade-offs and I, I do think that that's you know Mr. Wald's point about you know the struggles we have with parking in the downtown you know leaving a few more spaces here versus not may not be a material difference but it, you know in the short term it's a huge difference mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but is there or could there be something nearby that could be made into parking that might mitigate that immediate problem but also allow us to be more uh, robust in our planning here in, in that regard and maybe there's not I mean I don't know they, they may have Sort of slice this every way from Sunday, and it, it just doesn't work any other way. So that's, you know, I think part of what we want to hear about a little bit. So just um, parking, I had made a note um, when Mr. Steinberg was talking about those other events, and people don't always know that Amherst College does let people park in those lots on weekends, and it really could be better promoted because if you're going to the farmer's market or a fair, um, there are lots that are just almost almost as close as this one. And, um, you know, we, we can have that, that debate about parking, but if it were that easy to find another s spot to grab, um, probably w not that there couldn't be or wouldn't be, but uh, it's not readily apparent where, where we would gain those. So um, for some people, it's really important to be able to get that close to that particular block and that particular set of services and things that happen. And um, at the downtown parking working group meeting, um, Jen LaFountain, who's um, managing the parking system right now, said, you know, for some of the senior <coughs> citizens, it's just critical to be able to drive up to town hall to pay a tax bill or to do whatever business or register to vote in that. So um, there may be more than one way to solve that, but to not just wipe that out at, at this point felt important. Uh, there's a number of town staff who park here who are the in and out inspectors and whatever, and there's some accommodation where that that maybe could happen differently using the back lot. So there's some parking management things that could go in tandem with this, and there's probably two years to prepare for that that would take some of the pressure off this front 
area. I have a quick question about the map because I'm not great with scale. Um, so the place where you drive into and out of the parking lot behind Town Hall remains the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just that the street is closed off, for example, in this example, which is, of course, not the final well, plan. One way. But the idea is that the entire street is closed off basically up until that point of when, or it's, it's a little bit further down. I'm not sure what all those bushes are replacing. That's <laughs> what I'm confused by. That's right. No, you still, it's still it's through still a street. Okay. Right one way right in front of it. Okay. Street, you know, one way. Through a street, but one way. All right. Way. So what are those nine bushes replacing? The Plaza. That's the Bosque Plaza. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. But if I walked outside and looked there, what's <laughs> there now? You can't tell from this. And we don't I don't know. know. It's the grass in front of town. It's basically it's the, the grass. grass. Yeah. yeah. It's our grassy, <laughs> little tiny grassy slope will now, now suddenly it's, hold you know, nine it's, trees. It's, uh, okay. it's marigolds and... and uh, it's beautiful plantings, well, actually. That Mary does. Staff does. Yes. Well, what Mary right. does do wonderful space. work with that. So okay. It's not clear what they're going to do there. Yeah, it just they just it just seems large for the space. A bunch of so that's tree, what I'm trying to understand. Yeah, tree icon. But but yeah, so you still go in and out of the parking lot behind, and there is a one way that's attempting to tell me it's going which direction. Okay. South, yeah. I think. Yeah, we 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 need some. This was just a pretty in between thing. Uh, it's yeah. just, just to give you a, a yeah. vision. Remind so. us of the middle one that everyone can not like. <laughs> that everyone I'd rather you can look at the schedule. Of. That's what the meeting was about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, not exactly. Except but, it might be our last chance to say things like, and where's that place you climb? I mean, right. because we don't want to just so, say, oh, by the way, now we have 25 more questions. So I mean, we might still have 25 will. more questions, but. Shot. So it seems like we use the same engineering firm a lot and we don't seek lands people with sensitive you know that are particularly specialized in landscape architecture so when we look at this and we know that it's a, an engineering plan with some green on it I have wondered for a long time why we're not going out and seeking different firms for different kinds of jobs so I'm just going to put that out because I'm sure the engineering will be really spectacular um, getting the sidewalk and the grade and the subsurface drainage, but um, some of the things that we that are, are really the wow factor, I think we're losing in some of our selections. I'm just. I, I, but I think conceptually, when this started, it was a parking lot and the North Common. It wasn't seen as being one, and so you needed a firm that had both a landscape arm, which and an engineering arm for the for the uh, structural engineering part of the parking lot. There are not a lot of landscape firms that also have the the other part of it. So. You know, Weston Sampson was already engaged on the um, parking lot, and it seemed to make sense to just move forward with them on the landscape arm. And by all, I think most people, the most feedback has been pretty positive. Um, it's not a comment on that firm per se. It's yeah. just that we've been using that process, and we've been handing a lot of our major landscape projects to them, or to the same firm. I mm -hmm. wasn't going to name them, so I just well, would like to look at that. There's three firms that get a lot of our business: uh, CDM, Berkshire Design, and uh, West End Sampson. So those those are the three that tend to. And have we bid those? They do. We do get con um, for the um, the Groff Park. I believe we did Berkshire Design on that one. Yeah, and so they're the ones that's not on the state list. That's not the yeah. tried and true. So I'm just saying, some of the things I think we're reacting to. I, I just maybe maybe it's a conversation for another time, mm -hmm. but. Um, we want to have more sensitivity in the landscaping on some of our, I'd just like to see it opened up in a, in a bid process. This I would put under one of those categories of, you know, memos to future selves or to town mm -hmm. council, you know, wisdom to pass along or things for them to I'm think about. Passing so. it on to the manager. Right. So I think that's a good place to put it person. in. Wood for thought. Mm -hmm. So there's not an action item on this. Is there further no. comment for the manager? Any, any questions about the timeline itself and, and you know, we brought up a couple of points as far as uh, fine-tuning some of the language on it to be clear about what's what. Um, Who's doing what else? when? <laughs> right. 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 So I think what we'll do now is, is move on to our next uh, agenda item, which is the Pioneer Valley Charter 
Chinese Immersion Charter School and comments for, to the Department of Education. And I will make a brief, uh, I was, um, the chair of the Amherst School Committee reached out to me via email. I shared that with you all. Um, and so that's why our, that topic is on our agenda for this evening. However, because I am an employee of the school, this is one of those things that sort of hits that sweet spot of things where conflict could exist. I'm going to um, yield the chair to, to Ms. Brewer, who's our, our co-chair, our vice chair for the, for the month, and have her sort of carry this discussion for us. And uh, while I won't actually leave the room, unless you'd like me to, um, I will sit quietly and enjoy your comments relative to this topic. So Ms. Ms. Brewer, if you want to take the lead on this. Great, thank you. And so I appreciate Ms. Mills pulling together all this old information for us because we have, it does feel like it's a little bit like Groundhog Day that we have done this over and over and over again. So in our packet, for those of you following along at home, there is the letter from the school system that includes some very nice graphics dated November 21st, 2017. So yes, basically a year ago. Um, but there are also some other dates in here. Basically the most recent thing that happened was dated December 4th, 2017, and that was the letter from the select board um, saying, please don't allow the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School to expand its enrollment. We had previously also said that in February of 2017, so twice in one year. And in between there, as I indicated, there was a letter from the schools dated February 22nd and also one dated November 21st. We also, although we didn't for some reason that I can't ascertain, mention the additional piece of, big piece of data you got tonight on the desk that is special town meeting from fall 2017. There are two articles that are about, related to items that we're working on tonight and one of them is article 11 and of course you know we don't have page numbers on town meeting results but so go to article 11 and that's a resolution regarding charter school funding and expansion that the Amherst School Committee had brought forward to us and that was a voted resolution so it I to the best of my knowledge nothing has changed associated with the school's view or our community's view of the funding arrangements that make it really intolerable for the Pioneer Valley Chinese Inversion Charter School to expand. And so the school committee is in the process of writing another letter and suggested that we may wish to do the same. You all know I'm a former school committee member and so of course I'm all in on that. Um, what I'm wondering at this point is there is a deadline, of course, for comments when they're supposed to go in. And I was going to ask, since this wasn't available electronically Friday, but Ms. Mills pulled it all together, and I'm sure it's available electronically now. I was going to ask the chair of the Amherst School Committee to take a look and see if there was anything that jumped out as needing to be updated, basically, because we're, we're kind of writing our letters in concert in that they're pulling up the you know great levels of detail, and we're taking more of the town's approach, but also mentioning specific impacts on the schools. So I guess the questions are, one, are we going to write another letter? Two, who's going to write it? And uh, three, what other things did you think might need to be in it, having had a chance to look over our old letters over the course of time? And of course, we do also now have the resolution from town meeting that would have been sent to the same people, basically, as our letter had been sent. So just say still <laughs> across the top of the letter nothing has changed which to to a degree is at least true from the standpoint that the funding formula hasn't changed and there's no end in sight associated with that or with assuring that the compensation uh, which is not the correct word but haven't had enough coffee this evening associated with the um, there's normally a staggered amount that is reimbursed to schools but is subject to appropriation and frequently doesn't make its way all the way out to the schools. But it's a minor consideration in terms of all of this. What it really is, of course, as we stated before, is that it impacts the opportunities for the students in our schools when too many resources are going to the charter schools. So. Thoughts about why we would or would not send a letter or anything else that should include and in anyone who'd like to volunteer to update what we've written in the past, which I'm sure we can find in Word version someplace. She's 
she's chairing. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm sorry. you were leaving the room when we had that conversation. Okay. Yes, please, Ms. Madam, Madam Acting Chair. Yes. Um, I had an interesting um, conversation with a Amherst parent whose child goes to this school, and I just want to acknowledge that for um, you know, some of our residents are being educated at this school, and um, <coughs> it was that parent's position that you know that her child was at a disadvantage because um, they couldn't add this high, the high school facility, and you know we're we're kind of stuck with saying, well, it's not that we don't want that variety of educational choices we don't like the funding formula that puts the public school students um you know does harm to them but it do you, you know this parent's position was well let the charter school let the emergent school build the high school and then try to you know over time try to change the formula or do you say we don't want this to go forward until the formula is changed I think we, we almost have to say the latter, fix the funding formula, but I just want to acknowledge that it is also a hardship for students who are at that school to not be able to have this facility, and that is um, happening because the state has not addressed the problem with sucking badly needed dollars out of the public school system and putting those students um, at, at a disadvantage. So um, in, in joining with the school committee and writing another letter to just be clear that um, we would like all the students to have the benefits of a high quality education and it's really our issue is really with the way the funding um, puts our public schools at a, at a, at, a, at, a, at risk mr Steinberg yeah, <clears throat> I'm not entirely convinced that it's just funding because we have relatively small school and when you reduce student population, you reduce the opportunity of the um, school in scheduling courses to schedule as many options for students. and. Uh, I think that that's also something that we need to be considering. Um, it's probably uh, a greater problem for the smaller schools that are also within uh, smaller elementary schools in the region. They have the greatest impact of this, but I think that it flows through the entire system that when you start taking students, reducing student population, which is already being reduced, uh, that it has an additional impact on the traditional public schools. And uh, I guess what I would like to um, see somebody do, um, whoever's going to take charge of this letter, whether staff or from the board, is to spend some time with um, somebody in school administration and with the um, school committee just to make sure that all of the information that we're providing is still accurate because there are um, changes with dates and um, that we have not missed any information that is important. Thank you. Others? I think they've said it well. Great, because one of the things that was true in December, for example, that may have changed is at that time, they hadn't come close to filling their current enrollment of 584 in their lower grades. And so while I do actually really appreciate the sentiment that, of course, a child who's been attending a school and is looking forward to the next thing happening, I'm reminded of all the students who were looking forward to taking languages in our schools that we cut. Mm -hmm. So they had older siblings who took those classes. This is a mythical thing. This high school hasn't started yet. We're not taking away someone's high school. We have taken away our programs locally from our students who were expecting to, obtain, to have access to those programs, and we don't have the programs we used to have. And so 
it is funding and it is also a matter of local governance in terms of an elected school committee versus there is no elected body that has any oversight. It is all done administratively through the state. And yes, a lovely board of directors at the Chinese Immersion Charter School, but they're not subject to open meeting law and they are not responsible to the taxpayers as to how their money is spent. So it, it does feel like it's a number of different issues and it definitely impacts smaller schools. And I've heard Mr. Steinberg speak about this elsewhere as well. Um, you know, when, when Pelham and Shutesbury and Leverett lose students to uh, charter schools, it makes an even bigger impact because it, it never comes out evenly, you know, across the different grades. But I appreciate that we do need to be thoughtful about the fact that people are accessing this education right now and finding it a really good fit for their child. So, Mrs. Kruger. Um, why am I looking at him when you're chairing? Sorry. You didn't like what I was saying. No, 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 I did like what you were saying. Um, just to, just a kind of a footnote to the point about course offerings. And um, when my daughter went through Amherst High School, graduated in 1990, she took Chinese language in the high school and went on and chose a college where Chinese language was offered and spent part of her junior year in Beijing um, because of her interest in Chinese language. That course is not offered or it stopped being offered. I don't know if it's again, it's not the same as an immersion school, I'm not equaling it, but we have lost um, that's, you know, a, a variety of options um, over time because of, you know, Partly the drain from charter schools, other cutbacks as well. But it is um, sad to me that um, for my grandchildren in town, they couldn't change. <coughs> There's a number of language options that we did offer and are no longer able to offer. And that was my personal example. Yeah, not too much to add that. Again, I think, you know, I think the bottom line, as Ms. Kruger said in the beginning, is that we all agree the funding model is po impossible. I mean, just it's destructive. and completely unacceptable. And Mr. Steinberg's point about the size of schools is important, Ms. Brewer's about the offerings. You know, I, I would, in that context, remind you about the February 17 letter too, which talks for other services you're not being equivalent to those offered in the Amherst Public Schools, like special education, and also talks about diversity, transportation, English, and things like that. Uh, just a, a footnote about the languages. I think I met Ms. Brewer maybe 15 something years ago when we were working on precisely the language question. The school had very ambitious plans to do more language work and for a variety of reasons, it was hard to make that fit the class schedule and the testing environment and so forth. And we've really seen a terrible decay, as you said, too, over the last you know, decade and a half now. And it's, bottom line, I think, is what Ms. Ms. Brewer said also, we're not taking away something. Uh, that's important to make that very clear. And we are trying to provide the most benefits we can for the largest number of students who are funded through our taxes. So who would like to work on an updated letter with the chair of the school committee? Since I think this is one Mr. Bachelman can duck even despite all his experience <laughs> as a school committee member elsewhere. Oh, sigh. Um, I will do that if no one else wishes to do it, but I would prefer to not be that contact person, but I can do it. I simply will ask as I've already reached out to the school committee chair and said, one of us will work with you on this, on making sure it's updated appropriately. So unless Mr. Steinberg or Mr. Wald say, yes, I would much prefer to do that. He's the school specialist member. Then the question is, what do you want to see again versus what do you want to have us just sign? Because of course there's the awkward spot where we can't have Mr. Slaughter sign it. Um, because he's recused himself from the situation, but we have listed him in the past associated with, so whatever. But I, the question is, do you want to see a draft letter and look it over, or do you want to just accept that it will get done? And it will be presented to you as a fait accompli that has been yeah. signed by I guess, the vice chair. I think the one question that I have is, do we have any ideas to when the target date is to get this in? Either November 1. Of, hmm? November 1st is my understanding. Unfortunately. Ms. Brew? 
Yes, um, I'm fine um, letting it come to a, come back to us as an FYI after the fact. I don't know if the other members are, but um, if maybe some of what we talked about tonight as a kind of update, if it's if it, it may, may not may or may not have be redundant to what's already in the past letters, but to, if if that could be reflected in the next version along with the updates on numbers things that we talked about. I think that, for, you know, for example, the letter of December 4th says the town of Amherst voted unanimously, blah, 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 select board at a posted meeting December 4th to send you these concerns. I think some wording that varies on that that says these were the concerns we addressed at our public meeting. And, but don't blame any of the others for the wording. So I will take these notes then and work with the school committee chair, Ms. Ordonez, and see what we can come up with and get that, make sure that we make the deadline so that we have that done. All right, thank you for your help. And then I will turn it back to, and it, does it seem like I might as well mention Article 11? I mean, they got, us, they got another letter after we passed Article 11 at town meeting. Um, it seems like I sh we should probably reference that and attach it because it l we didn't do it before because it got sent separately. But it, it is town meeting's last mention of this issue, and it was only a, a year ago. We don't have a motion, but do we need one? I don't think we have anything. Maybe a motion to authorize the vice chair to. I move um, to authorize the vice chair to write a letter to blank blank blank. Um, Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. Massachusetts Board of Elementary um, and Secondary Education. Um, on behalf of the select board, um, reiterating our position to not expand the Chinese Immersion School. Second. Any further discussion? Yeah, no, the only other thing is that, well, I couldn't take on the primary responsibility if you decide to you wanted to consult one other right. person because it's yeah, not be getting great. to a yeah. quorum um, you can consult me and call on my help um, that would be terrific thank you any further discussion all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. So that passes. Any opposed? Any abstentions? No, because we all four said one we have one absent. absent. One absent. absent. We can count you as absent. So, um, so that passes unanimously with one absent. <coughs> thank you, and thank you, Mr. Slaughter. Turn it to you. So next on our agenda is the PVA root restoration and allocation of town meeting funds from the annual town meeting. Uh, of our last of last spring, um, Mr. Bachman and I met today with some folks from PVTA, the administrator, uh, the I'm not sure of his exact title, but the director of the UMass Transit Service, uh, and a couple of folks from UMass. I'm, I'm not sure of their titles, so I don't want to. Shane Conklin from uh -huh. uh, finance and and uh, phone yep. from. Relations or something. Community relations, communicate. External relations, I believe, yes, exactly. So, and we talked about, you know, sort of uh, some options that we had, you know, I had I'd done some, some outreach to the PVTA about potential root restoration. Um, we looked at those a little bit and, you know, what it would cost to restore some roots. Um, so one of the issues that, you know, that the UMass Transit Service is struggling with in the current semester is just having enough drivers to, uh, accommodate this the schedule that they wanted to have which was a reduced schedule um, uh, it, it seems as though the hiring is has been um, proceeding nicely and the training is underway and so they are going to be more capable to to uh, run routes in the in the second semester than they were this fall and so some some of the reductions that were made that were less about the financial impact but more about just having people to drive the buses um, those will essentially go away by you know uh, the December break the intercession break um, I think we had a productive conversation today about uh, about where we are and what what concerns we have uh, you know um, there are some routes that uh, are were not on the list I was looking at I was looking at mostly and and to ask PVTA around routes particularly in Amherst or primarily in Amherst there's some routes that are a little 
uh, more of more concern to the university that go into uh, some other towns a little bit more. And so they were like, well, you know, how do we sort of to our constituency sort of talk about these things in a, in a way that makes sense as far as restoration is concerned. And so we've got some more work to do. We've got to, uh, we're going to get some updated numbers on, on what the cost would actually be given that we're, um, you know, now into the, the first semester. And so some of the, the numbers will need to be updated a little bit. Um, but one of the other concerns that was raised was relative to, you know, if we put service back and then you know, we only have money that works until essentially the end of the fiscal year, basically till the summertime, um, that doesn't solve the problem. So we just sort of put it out there and then pull it back again a semester later. You know, is that more harmful than good? Um, so th there is some other uh, monies available at the state level for some innovative work. The, the, the governor's formed a task force uh, and potentially uh, that could be a resource. The, the conversation, I mean, we asked the question today, it's like, well, can that money be spent if we were to acquire, you know, some support via that mechanism? Um, which is, which is potentially, you know, essentially kind of grant to, to do some innovative uh, type of service, um, you know, could that carry over into a new fiscal year? Because it was appropriated for fiscal 19 in the state budget. Um, and right now, the, you know, given where we are in the fiscal year, it would be difficult for them to take proposals for projects and award grants and have people spend the money within the fiscal year. So while they'll officially make a ruling on it in the next couple of weeks as far as whether or not that chunk of money that the state set aside uh, for that, you know, innovation in, in transportation, um, they'll get a ruling in the next couple of weeks as to whether or not that'll carry to a new fiscal year. And I mean, given sort of what it takes to do proposals and review them and award grants and that sort of thing, it's likely that they'll extend into the year. So it could be a thing where our current funding that we have could get us to the end of the year and then we potentially could be awarded a grant like that to sustain in a different way. So, so there's a few different ideas that are sort of, you know, we're, we're put out there today that we're, we're going to explore over the next couple of weeks. Um, just from the standpoint of scheduling, you know, printing of schedules, you know, uh, scheduling of drivers, et cetera, et cetera, we're going to have to, you know, kind of commit to something with, with PBTA really toward the end of the month at the latest. Um, but we've got some more work to do. And so I just wanted to update you as the, we had a, I think a quite productive meeting. Um, I think one of the other things I, I wanted to sort of share with them, uh, with the university was that I think that they and we could be uh, advocating pretty profoundly for, for public transport, support for public transportation because uh, it's, it's an essential and, and fundamental thing within our community. Um, as I often say, those, those dollars spent on public transportation are very high leverage, certainly in the PBTA. Um, so they're high leverage dollars in that regard. Um, but I also think given that we have, you know, a, we will have a brand new representative and a brand new senator uh, in the legislature, we're, we're going to need to, to be uh, seeking as many ways as we can to sort of uh, advocate at the legislative level to, to help promote uh, support for, for public transportation. So. Um, that was part of what I was going to say. Um, I've, I've heard murmurings that transportation is going to be a major agenda item at the, for the state legislature coming up. And because we have, um, we'll have a new delegation, not officially, people aren't in yet, but it may not be too soon to start uh, meeting with those people and getting them on board because I think they would be very strong advocates, even though they're new legislators. Um, so th I think that's one thing we can do proactively. And second, just my own two cents about would it do more harm than good. I think if you don't have a car and you're trying to get to work, it would be better to have that route for six months and then lose it than to not have it at all. Like, I don't see how that's going to do more, more harm that you might have something that you could lose later than not having it at all. So if I have to get to work <laughs> and there's a way for me to get there, with the bus, I'll take it for as long as I possibly can with the idea that maybe we will have some um, legislative um, help between now and um, in the end of the, the fiscal year. And certainly, you know, it, it wasn't a clear cut yes or no. I mean, no, it's just I'm sort just of saying, having like, that debate, you know, it's like, could we or could we not? not should we, should we not? Transportation, I don't see it helps to end right. it sooner. Right.
Mr. Steinberg, do you have a comment or question? Uh, question actually has to do with the letter that we received that was also in the packet dated September 27th. And uh, first of all, um, it quotes our share of the assessment, and I wasn't sure how that matches up against our transportation fund or if it comes from other places. And second of all, what is the major question really out of this is they are asking for a 2.5% increase. Was that built into the original budget so that uh, the amount the town meeting added was above and beyond what we're actually having to pay? Part of that, if, mm -hmm. if you want to answer the last part, I'll answer the first part. So this letter is actually, <coughs> in, in some ways, entirely separate from the issue of that 53,000, right. because this is our normal assessment. And so the PVTA is allowed by Chapter 161 to increase their assessment by 2.5%. And it works much the same way it does for property tax in our community. So our actual assessment may go up more than 2.5% or less, depending on essentially how many miles are driven within our town. And then on top of that, because we partner with the Five Colleges, Inc. and the university, um, and being clear to note that UMass Transit Service is a distinct entity from UMass. Those are two very different things. Um, UMass Transit Service is a, an organization that provides the service. University is uh, essentially a customer like we are. Um, and so we have arrangements with them that then slice our overall assessment within the town of Amherst into pieces. And you can see on that last page of that letter, um, it shows the other communities that also have s similar sort of parsings of their assessment based on mileage and the partnerships they have with the university and or the five colleges, Inc. Um, so that's sort of the first piece. And, and this is based on, uh, like I said, on our mileage within the town. Um, and so, it, I think our mileage has been fairly steady, so I think our, our overall increase year over year is probably about 2.5%. I don't know exactly off the top of my head whether it really was or not. Um, I mean, Mr. Bachman can settle that question and then also address the, the 53 and how it fit relative to that. So this is these are these are funds are factored into the budget, but, but it's on the cherry sheet, so it doesn't show up in our actual budget, but it shows up in our budget planning documents. So when the assessments come through on the cherry sheet, this is factored into it because it's, this is what they've given us. Uh, so we know what's coming in on the charges on the cherry sheet, um, so that so it doesn't come out of the transportation fund. It just already shows up in the cherry sheet. So when the uh, budget uh, quotes an amount for that um, we're charged, I think it was ninety-one thousand was an additional listed. That's for the. Um, <coughs> route that we pay for entirely because it's all within the town that we added. Is that? Yeah. Oh, I'm really confused. Yeah. So we no longer buy any routes separately. Um, so I think that the, the um, the transportation does fund that portion of it. Um, because it says in the uh, town manager's budget, the most recent town manager from January, intergovernmental of 91831 includes funds for VTA subsidies and taxes to the general fund for parking facilities. That is what the sentence is. And uh, so I was, um, do I assume that some portion of that and that, that's where I was getting confused when I was trying to try and track it. So for, are we asking the same question or a different question? Because my question was going to be on this last page where it says that of the amounts that all went up, which were 30000 more than, than the previous year, but the amount we pay, because we know UMass pays most of it and Five Colleges pays a large part of it, is 132960 mm -hmm. Is that the figure we predicted in our budget when we wrote our budget, because this obviously came out after our budget did, or had they already told us that's going to be your number? We already had that number. That was our exact number. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that didn't change. So the fact that we had the extra money means it's still extra. It wasn't like needing to absorb right. some of this. Exactly. That exact number. That's ultimately what the question is. So thank you. Okay. Good. I was hoping we were asking the same question. It's, it's less than linear, let's just say, as far as how this all fits together. But 
Um, and to be perfectly honest, it's better than it was because it used to, it's more forward funded now than it was in the past. It used to be backward funded, and so it was you'd have already in in this circumstance you actually um, you can budget knowing the amount as opposed to the past where you budgeted a guess of what you thought it was going to be and then you got the bill for what it really was and so you could be off and you could be off a lot so if you had a lot of construction in your town it changed the mileage significantly you could really have a significant change in your assessment um, under the newer system which has been in place about four or five years um, you can budget an amount that is the amount in advance <clears throat> Yes. Just um, speaking of the fifty-three thousand, that was to make up, um, and if if roots were cut that were, um, we wanted to restore. And I'm not sure. I, I understand there was a labor driver issue, so things were cut, which actually represents some cost savings in the short term, but not intentionally. Um, if there is now actual root, um, you know. If, if there's a service gap now that we would need to look to the 53,000? I mean, just because it's appropriated doesn't mean it has to be spent. It was spent to make up a gap in service. If there's not a gap in service, then I'm not sure at this point we would need to spend it. Right, what we've been looking at as far as the roots are concerned are, are in particular, and, and again, you know, UMass has some, some ideas about some other roots that they have some interest in, but the ones we were primarily looking at, and this was based in some respects on the public hearings about the reductions that were potentially going to happen, a lot fewer ended up happening than was discussed back in June, I think it was, or maybe it was earlier than that. But the roots are the um, 30, 31, 33, and 34. Now 34 is the campus shuttle, which runs a loop, and the 35 is a similar, but in the opposite direction. 30, 31, 33, um, and I don't know the order right off the top of my head, but you know, one of them goes to Sunderland to from Sunderland to, let's say South Amherst. There's one that's called the Shopper Shuttle, um, which was actually in the paper last Friday relative to changes to the where the bus actually stops. Um, and then the third one is North Amherst to uh, Old Belchtown Road. Um, and so the routes that largely run within town, and what we've been looking at, so two things changed relative to uh, the reductions that needed to be made. One was the time between when buses run, what they call the headway, um, and the other was the, the number of runs, how late in the day those runs occur. And that's really the piece that we've looked at more. The change in the timing of the, of the existing routes is, is a much trickier problem to solve because it starts to interact with because a driver will run one loop, of, one loop of one run and then go into a different run, a different route. And so that starts to be a much more complex so things to change when we're doing a, an independent contract. But to add some on to the end of the day was what, we were, what we've been looking at. Um, and so uh, a number of those reductions that in those routes that I just mentioned could, could be restored with, with the 53, but not all of them. Um, so that's so part of why we were having a conversation with the university about do they have an opportunity to sort of pick up some of that as well. Um, but then, of course, they raised the question of there are some other routes that, that impact their constituencies uh, that aren't as many, you know, they're not as many miles in Amherst. They're a lot more miles in other towns. And so uh, they have a little different point of view, which is understandable relative to that. So, um, so we're, you know, we had an initial conversation today. We're going to get some refreshed numbers in the next week or so. We're going to meet about a week um, and kind of go through this again and try to, to see if there's a, a right fit and mix of things. And, and, uh, and like you say, it's, you know, we've, we have the appropriation. Do we have to spend it? We don't. But we want to be high leverage. But we also want to try to uh, also think about how, to, how do we move forward. Um, relative to this, you know, as far as, you know, our advocacy with, with legislature and legislators and, and other things uh, to try to have a you know, sort of co coherent plan of attack relative to this and, and trying to keep the, the service running at, a, at the best levels we can. So not pretending I've ever understood how the amounts are calculated in terms of the assessments, and I, I don't need to, that's fine. What I'm trying to get at, though, is 
something I think you've both touched on, which is that the impact on the services that we've actually seen versus what was predicted versus, you know, this has gone through many iterations. Are we paying the same and getting less in a proportional sense to the other people who are paying for it? So meaning who is it impacting the most? I think is, is it sounds like one of the conversations you've actually been having is, is it mainly impacting, for example, that campus shuttle, which is you know, mostly students, mostly faculty, mostly not people just out in the town of Amherst trying to get to a job from their home because it's starting and stopping on campus versus getting from place, getting from a home to a job and a job to home or to shopping or something like that. Um, and so I think that's just one of the things that, that people wonder about over time is, and I, th it, and so I wanted to bring it up because I wanted to reinforce that it sounds like you're talking a little bit about that already, right. like these, as these assessments aren't based on and oh then we cut this thing because we didn't have enough drivers so it actually turns out we're shifting who pays what for the assessment or they still have to pay the assessment but they're actually who's it impacting the most is it impacting town writers the most is it impacting UMass writers the most is it impacting the going back and forth to Smith College the most you know that that sort of thing and so I think that that's just something that people will want to understand better as these things continue to unfold. Right. Part of our contract with, with uh, UMass Transit Service and Five Colleges Inc., we have a, you know, an arrangement with each of them that essentially outlines you know, the rules by which we play mm -hmm. relative to how those, those routes that have common overlap you know, are divvied up. Uh, some routes carry a lot more uh, townspeople per se, right. and we carry a lot more of the burden on those particular routes versus other routes that are like assume. the 34 is right. almost exclusively students, so UMass generally Does. pays for most generally. of that route. So, so those things are sliced and diced within our arrangement with them um, in, in trying to, you know, in looking at ridership and, you know, they do rider surveys and they try to, you know, over time, you know, adjust accordingly in our, in our arrangements with those, those other partner organizations. So we do try to keep that in balance um, as, we, as we go along. So that's also part and parcel of this conversation. Two more quick questions, hopefully one of them super quick, which is, so we talked about we don't have to spend it. We obviously want to leverage it in the most effective way possible. What actually happens to the money at the end of the year if we don't spend it? Does it stay in the transportation fund or because it's a transportation fund, we have to do something different with it or where does it go? It's money that came from the transportation fund, so it would stay in the transportation fund. It came from, and it hasn't gone anywhere yet, no. so it right. really hasn't, it's, but it would just stay there. Because it's and, an enterprise fund. But yeah, it's the there. reserve fund for appropriation, and if we right. don't actually spend it, then it stays there. And it just stays there. That's what happens, and we just write a line about it in the budget book. Okay, so that's cool. And then the other one is in regards to the Big Y Shopping Plaza, and obviously this is that, again, that complex situation with on the one hand, it's all about the building owner, not necessarily the customers of any of those particular buildings, and so that's a whole different conversation. But it does impact people who aren't necessarily college students who depend on that bus and they depend on a shelter that doesn't exist on the CBS side of the road, and they've been able to shelter at the Big Y, and that just got taken away. And so it's hard for people out in the community, as was reflected in the newspaper article to understand that th that's just up to the property owner to decide that so w what can we tell people <laughs> about how that works and and when they say well we really want that back and it isn't necessarily we don't know what big Y's particular opinion is on it versus the you know so that if a customer goes up and complains at the service desk right versus right. it's the property owner that uh, big Y Right. leases from and so I, I'm not really sure what to tell people other than sorry um, right. it's, so it is a, it is a tricky circumstance it's not a public way in other words for the bus you know the bus essentially you know UMass Transit Service essentially needs permission to go into that parking right. lot you know and as you know essentially the the owners of the building uh, you know the landlords said mm, we're not so comfortable with that for these reasons so UMass Transit was like okay if you don't want us to go there anymore here's what we'll do so they, they are, you know, bound in much the same way if we as the town of Amherst said, you can't go here anymore because this is too big, you know, you can't go on this bridge because your buses are too heavy. Mm -hmm. They would have to comply with that as well. So, um, you know, I think that, that how people would 
um, I mean, I don't think, you know, UMass Transit Service is the is sort of the bad guy here. They're responding to a request from, from a property owner. Have to um, do. But, but I think that, that people might be best served to, to reach out to either the, the clients, of, you know, that are tenants in those buildings and or the, the ownership of those buildings would be my suggestion, but Ms. Kruger? Mr. Slaughter, people could reach out, the town could reach out. So the town has um, a kind of bully pulpit in this. Yes, um, we, UMass, UMass Transit, the town, would like that to be restored. And sometimes the big Y owners want something from us. So we have a, a, a little bit different position. We, we can try asking nicely, but um, I think when, when the town calls and says, we would like you to come to a meeting to talk about this, this is creating a problem. What can we do that could work for everybody? And maybe it's, you can only stand in this area or well, there was too much. I mean, I don't know if it's solvable, but the town can have a strong voice in advocating sure. for the people um, who we serve. And I don't know, I, I, this is not an area I'm familiar with, and you probably know better than me about having an actual bus shelter installed in that general area. And if PBTA could, you know, has looked at that, could look at that. And, you know, maybe if, if we don't spend the 53000 on other things, maybe we could help augment that cost too. Because there's going to be more and more activity along University Drive in all kinds of ways. So it would benefit by having enhanced public transportation. Um, you know, I, I can tell you just relative to, to shelters, um, you know, uh, PBT is happy to put them up if they can, and it really is about do we have resource, you know, do they have the resources, do they have the rights of way, sometimes, you know, you run into to rights of way circumstances, um, but they do, uh, you know, look at those regularly, and so if we, you know, make that kind of request, they would obviously sort of consider it seriously and it is you know it is an alternative uh, way to, to potentially use that that money that would be beneficial so I'll reach out um, I'm actually going to be I'll be a PBTA tomorrow actually rel not relative to the advisory board but another um, subcommittee rel um, so I'll take a moment and, and uh, while I'm there and just ask that question around the shelter there just to see the circumstance and and I'll also pose the question relative to you know um, the changes at the at that at that location and you know sort of should we reach out to the, you know we as the town reach out to the to the to the building owners or or talk to UMass Transit more about what are some alternate things that could be done there from from the standpoint of of uh, you know I think the the concern the building people had was was relative to sort of the bus negotiating the parking lot and so it's a terrible parking lot <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, those are legitimate concerns on their part and safety questions that they have. And so is there something that we as a town could, could potentially uh, offer suggestion or, or comment on? We can certainly look into that and see what options are available. I move that you do those two things. <laughs> I, I would like it to be in our records that we, that we were advocating for our community this way um, and through you, and I appreciate that and you can write it exactly as you'd like, but one is associated with talking with, I mean, you can bring it up at PBTA, but we know that there's going to have to be a conversation with the property owner associated with that. And it's not like we told them in that level of detail how to design their parking lot to make it awkward for buses to move through it. I mean, there's a lot of mess in terms of how that we parking lot was designed. We and, and we could have maybe made it, helped yep. them make it a little better, but, um, it's not like something has suddenly happened right. um, over time. And as we do have continued development on University Drive, then more people would want to stop in a bus somewhere along there. So that also makes sense from that standpoint. But again, for our, for our community, I mean, it's one thing if you know, you're know you 19 and you can carry two bags of groceries and you don't mind getting a little wet, but we have seen that there is obviously a much larger segment of the population that uses that bus stop. And then secondarily to ask about the bus shelter itself, and they should be able to come up with. I know they have rubrics on. Oh yeah, it's it's really how many we, trips, and then like you said, if they have authorization on the property and all that right, good stuff. Right. I mean, some will be simple questions that we can answer relative to our own right of way. Um, if we have, by virtue of the sidewalk, sufficient right of way and clearance relative to, you know, there's ADA compliance that goes with those shelters and and that sort of thing. So. Um, 
we can, you know, some of those things are things we can check on just relative to, or very easily with, with PVTA or in concert with them, just sort of what the, what the options are relative to shelter. And then the, the funding question is a secondary one, but, but nonetheless, it's certainly um, worth asking um, those questions. So I, I will definitely take those two things, uh, two things, you know, to the PVTA, PVTA tomorrow and ask those questions while I'm there and, uh, um, you know, begin the dialogue about, about that. Oh, should, do we have a second on a motion that's oh, really not written? Second. <laughs> I sort of mumbled second. I'm, trust, I'm trusting between Mr. Bachelman and Ms. Mills and Mr. Slaughter. You know exactly Probably what we're asking need to about. Be that formal, but yeah. But um, it would be more easily reflected in the minutes and give us an opportunity to follow up in future. Right. So let me find my motion sheet so I can make a note of it on my motion sheet. But. Um, Um. Is there further discussion on that? Sorry. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous, and I will, as I said, take that up with, with PBHA starting tomorrow. It'll be, a, I think, a, multiple conversations will be involved, but that's yes. quite all right. I'm going to be, be there go fight the regularly game. anyway, so we'll be in touch with them regularly about, about that. So we'll, we'll touch base on that topic. And we, again, appreciate the extra effort it takes to go to Springfield to deal with all these questions that you've been doing for us, so thank you. My pleasure. Um, so next up, we have shade tree regulations. And as I said earlier at the, in our meeting, I don't think we'll actually adopt those, but I did want to give us an opportunity to, to offer or provide a little bit additional comment. I know that at least one member had some, some additional things that they wanted to mention relative to that um, particular item. Um, and so if we'll locate that in our packet Next item. Yep. so one thing I noticed is that we had we added you know new format and then it went back to the old format so we have a new format suggested by the bylaw review committee with right. the fines all up the beginning and that sort of thing so I mean that doesn't materially change some of the things but um, there were some there was a memo from uh, Mr. Bachman, relative to the shade tree regulations, did you want to go through that memo a little bit with us, or um, just to note that uh, the comments that were adjusted were recommended by town council? But I think that um, you know, as members had comments that we can include in the next version that you get next week. I'd appreciate hearing them now. So, sure. I didn't even notice the format. So, thank you, Mr. Slaughter, because I'm not used to the new one yet. Um, you know, some of it's just the stuff that we notice. We say, you know, it's not actually a number, a letter E or something. It's actually a, a standalone section. And I can give that material that's mostly just typographical. But there are actually some substantive things here that concern me. And one is, well, and I would like us to have the, char the charge in our packet next time as well for the Public Shade Tree Committee. But in terms of substantive issues, the... Um, I think it should be made clear on page four, and this is this is my fault for not noticing this one before. I'll take I'll take full credit for that. Under G1, talking about anyone wishing to remove or, or prune a public shade tree must submit a written application to the tree warden. I think it should elaborate here that the tree warden then has to determine whether or not the tree is in fact within the public right of way. I'm concerned about people coming to the counter being told that nah, it's probably not in the public right of way, and you know, we, I think people should consider. I think we should <coughs> consider that being. Just if the tree's not within the public right away, then the tree warden just says, nope, that one's fine. Um, but rather than it just being informal, it, it feels, given that there are all these punishments associated with it, it feels like if there's any question, people should go ahead and do an application. Which then leads us to page five, where I'm really confused by where we ended up in the fees section, because in the fees section it says, all applications for removal or pruning of public shade trees shall be accompanied by a fee, 
of $90 per inch of the tree to be removed, but there's a couple problems with that. One is that, you know, it might not actually be a public shade tree, so you don't need to write a check if it's not actually a real thing. And that, again, leads us back to the, do you really want an informal assertion, ascertainment by, it isn't going to be the tree warden standing there at the counter. And the second is that you can't waive something if you've already made them pay it. And so I'm, I'm confused about something getting pushed together. And then it also says the applicant's responsible for costs associated with advertising for the public hearing, then I'm not really sure what the fee's paying for. Um, and I think we should be clear on that, what the purpose of the fee is. I would think that rather than trying to add on a bill for legal notice, we should just go ahead and incorporate that in whatever fee we're charging or however we do that normally. But, um, any board a butter notification they pay. How do they go about doing that, though? They hand in the cards that shows that they sent it out, but it's on their dime. But so see, that's extra to the fee. But see, that's what I'm saying. This says advertising for the public hearing. So, how are they going to pay for the public oh. hearing? I mean, who's going to give them a bill? I, I don't understand how that would actually work. And so, I'm sure there's. We give them a bill. That's how it's done. So. So that gets done at the same time as an application's made that has a fee per inch that might get waived. I'm, I'm very confused. So if you're making people pay when they do the application, then it's determined that, walk me through it. I mean, how can so, you waive a fee so, if you've already paid it? So if someone says, I'd like, here's the, here's the fee. I mean, what, like what we recommend when people get a parking fine, you pay it and then you ask for it to be rescinded or waived and we pay if we send a check back. We're talking thousands of dollars on some of these that, that we aren't going to ask people to spend thousands of dollars up front and then waive it later. Are we, I, I just find that very strange. Yeah. Wouldn't you make the determination first of whether the fee will be applicable and what the fee will be like what if there's six trees which we've seen someone has to know, determine the diameter and whether they're in the public right away or not and then say well the real cost is only th you know three trees not six trees so then we just so they'd have to pay for six trees and then get reimbursed for three that weren't applicable after the determination was made Mr. Summer? Yeah. Well, a couple of things. One is I would suggest that because we're talking all about one section H in the first paragraph starts as has been quoted many times, all applications shall be accompanied by a fee. And then the last paragraph says that the tree, tree warden may waive the removal fee. Um, it was, it can be assumed whether it's clear enough, um, however, is a judgment call I think we need to make, but I think it can be assumed that uh, the fourth paragraph um, is uh, to be read in conjunction with the first yeah, paragraph. You said that last time. And it uh, it. so that um, it, it really takes care of it, it as a self contained okay. yeah. document. Um, the other thing that I would uh, ask, however, is uh, in the first sentence there, we use the term DMB, yes. which yeah. is different from DBH. any other term we right. use yeah, because it's, uh, it's right. DBH in right. every other place that we use the term. Yeah, it yeah. So out. is that intended to be DBH? Yeah, it's, it's measured at breast. Measured at right, but it's not defined. It's supposed to be B, but it should be yeah. spelled out. DBH, not DMB. Right. Diameter measured, measured at, at breast, DMB. But it's not defined. That was my answer. It's not defined. No, but it's not the other one, Andy. It's, it is. It actually is the other one. Is the other one? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. If there's, a, if it's right. the real, it if it is a separate one, then it's missing from the definition section. And okay. if it isn't a separate one, then it's it should a typo. Be, okay, so that, <laughs> right. should be, that just mm -hmm. needs that, that's the that's the point exactly. Okay. It was. Yeah, it was it originally struck me as an undefined term, and then I realized maybe it wasn't a question of an undefined yep. term. Got it. Mr. Wall? Yeah, I'm glad Mr. Steinberg caught that, because I noticed that too. And on, on that same issue, if you look at the definitions on page one, 
Uh, paragraph 2, critical root zone, refers to DBH, but DBH isn't defined until paragraph 3, so that probably is an issue. I had a very, very minor, I'm glad Ms. Brewer raised these questions too about the, the fines, which made me think of something that's actually pretty minor, but as long as we're doing all this due diligence and thinking we like about minor. the future. Yeah, it's, we're good at it. Um, the process that was described says at the top of page 4, uh, G1 refers to a written application. Does that mean writing on a piece of paper? I mean, it's an entirely serious question. It's trivial, but you know, do we have application? Do we have you know? For sometimes we consider email an adequate means of informing people. Sometimes we require a written postcard being sent, printed, sent. Do we have electronic means for applications, or does it require a paper application filled out on site? Or and I'm just, I'm just wondering if there's a general yeah. town. I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, I can find out for you. So my issue, and I'm glad we're not um, voting to adopt this tonight, is, the, and I've raised, I've raised this repeatedly, I am not comfortable with the waiver for hardship unless there's some, um, something written that explains how that will be determined um, so that it's applied consistently. If it's based on income, um, circumstance, I want a written hardship policy that somebody can look at and say it was applied um, equitably to all people who ask for the hardship waiver. And without that, I can't vote to adopt this. I may be the minority, but I'm really frustrated that we just say, tree warden may waive for hardship. That's just not acceptable to me. So I think, if I may, yes. so I think town council's response to that question was, there is no definition. I think the question last time was, what is the definition? There is no definition. So if we want to create a definition, we would, or remove the, the waiver for hardship provision. I don't know how you would go about, um, I mean, it would take an, a, a substantial amount of work, I think, to determine a process to, um, to do it, and I think that's your point, is that there is, who's gonna make that determination, says the tree warden, and what standard is the tree warden going to use? And I think that's a, it's a legitimate point. I posed, you know, in the cover memo, I posed it to town council, this was town council's response, um, and her response was basically, be consistent, whatever you do, just be consistent, and that's not adequate, I, can, I mean, I'm reading from you. To me it's not, because I've seen, I, I, I just know how these things go, or you have, one Everybody's warden who's hardship. very vigilant about having a standard, and another one who sees, oh well, they're you know they're two professors, so not a hardship. Oh well, this person, I know their family, and they're really having a hard time. That's I, I don't want it to be. A, if it's mm -hmm. a sliding scale on income, then just print a sliding scale on income. Mm -hmm. Would you be okay with removing the? F I don't want to remove the hardship either because this is really pricey for some people, and it's also sometimes. Um, a safety issue for site visibility and all kinds of reasons and so it's simpler to remove it but I'm not right well option uh, yeah. not I'd rather see some attempt to scale it to something we already do where we do okay. some kind we'll of look and see if there's some other I'm trying to think if there's any provision that provides a hardship waiver and for f fees like this that we can just steal from we'll do some some other town may have something too. Yeah. Mr. Wall? I mean, the only thing I can think, which is not a fee based one, but when we enacted the historic, local historic district legislation, we had a provision there for hard, you know, you could have a hard, or a demolition delay, you know, hardship is an, is, is an allowable justification uh, for a waiver, but, but it's, it's, not not, defined. it's not defined. There's either, not an so. income grade that goes along with it. Right, that's all I'm saying. Make your pleading to the historical commission, they say, well, that sounds like a hardship to me, you get it. Right, so that's, that's the way it's operated there, just based on the common sense yeah. one hopes of the uh, enforcing body. Sure. So a, a couple of other substantive, um, rather than the typo, for example, of saying $300 without the zero, zero, and <laughs> 500 with, because I know we don't pay KP law to make corrections like that. But um, I, I would like us to discuss briefly two separate issues. One is, well, actually, I'm gonna go back to the thing about the removal and the waiver. In terms of, it needs to be clear how the application process works without putting that in the regulation, which I can totally appreciate because it might become electronic, it might go through a different department, whatever. But it needs to be clear that 
you come in and you say, I think this is a public shade tree and I want to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And then the tree warden can say, no, it's not. Check. You're done. Mm -hmm. As opposed to whatever wonderful person we have at the counter who doesn't actually isn't the tree warden. And then secondly, if it's not true, okay, now you're going to do an application. It's going to probably cost you, you know, X amount of dollars, rough case, because it's 90, you know, how big's your tree? You know, they could give them a spitball estimate. Do you still want to keep pursue this? Yes. Okay. So then the tree warden's going to have to figure out in there, you know, if it's six trees versus one tree, that is a huge amount of money. And so expecting somebody to write a check for $6,000 to get the process going seems unreasonable to me and without knowing what the discretion policy is associated with the PO. So I, I don't think that just, you know, putting sentences one and four closer together really helps because part of the problem here is we say, an application's accompanied by a fee, then it says it's a removal fee. So it's like, is it an application fee? Is it a removal? There just needs to be a little wordsmithing to clarify what's going on there. Sort of order of events and sort of, do, you know, do we, is the fee charged in the, on the front end or, I, I, I get your point, is that really or it's about sort of. before you cut the tree. The, the <laughs> I mean, we know that part. Yeah. You, you can't cut it down until you give us some money, but you have to have a hearing too. But, right. But do you have to write a check at, at the very beginning, or is it like step two of right. writing a so check? Sort of articulating that. And then would if be it's helpful. step two, then maybe that's when the waiver. I mean, I don't right. know where at which point the so waiver process comes. I would in. suggest you you know you'd make the application. The tree warden would make the determination about which trees are public or not. What size is the official size? Therefore, what the cost would be, what the advertising would cost, because I presume that's a fairly fixed thing. So that would all be, you know, sort of reported back to the person, and then, you know, sort of balls in their court to move it ahead, and you know, then they can apply for hardship waiver at that right. point. And so, just kind of articulating those steps in. A, in I, I think it may be helpful. I, mean, I think our people who work the counters do that already. When people come right. in for a common vic license, we tell them what it costs, and we, you know, or if, you know, there's the schedule there, and our, our our staff are trained to help people, and not they don't require them to pay for something they don't need. So if someone comes in for a building permit and they say you may not need a building permit for this, they check on it first before they say, well, this is, may not be in the public way or not. So. I think that you have to give some credit to our staff that they're going to guide people appropriately and not they're, they're not going to say, I can't accept this without, they're going to say, well, maybe it's not in the public way. Let's check on that first. I think there's some common sense things that our staff are used to dealing with people. And they don't expect people to know this going in. So, so maybe to be clear, I'm not <coughs> saying they aren't capable of getting the answer. I'm saying they aren't necessarily going to be able to get the answer for the person while they're standing there just like they might not be able to get an answer on whether or not you can build a fence next to your house because it's too close to the property line. Mm -hmm. right. We are not spitballing those answers. It's real, actual right. data they go and get. I understand that. And so that's what I'm trying to say is that we, it's not, I don't think, no matter how well trained they are, the person at the counter is, is really, unless they're going to talk to the tree warden to find out if it's in the public way. They're not going to base it on their interpretation of GIS. They need to find out from the tree warden at some point in there, I wish, should think. Uh, but that may not be an immediate process. I mean, it's not, it doesn't have to be on speed dial. It's that you turn it in and you'll find out. We'll, we'll let you know if it's. Yeah, but I think the normal process is they call the tree warden and say, can you meet this person at their house and look at the tree? The tree warden gives them advice right then and there. And that's typically the way we would manage this. We don't, the tree warden doesn't say, I don't have an application. I can't go out and meet with someone. They go and they meet with a person and then they say, well, I need to check on whether it's in the public way or not. And I, so I think, um, I, I just don't know if we're trying to fix a problem that doesn't exist. So with, maybe with, the word. With putting a lot of detail into this that might say, well, you can't process it until you, you know, whatever it is. So You might be able to remove some wording in order to reflect that. Yeah. that. Yeah. rather than trying to add more to explain it away. Yeah. Just remove more to make it clearer mm -hmm. that, this, that this is going to be handled. But we don't, have, we don't want the step-by-step -step process mm -hmm. in here. The other two issues are associated with one, I appreciate that, that town council finally defined for us the 300 versus 500 issue that we keep going around in circles about. But I think we need to make a decision as to whether or not we're willing to, we're, we're willing to put into the regulation, because the bylaw allows us to do that, 
but that doesn't mean we have to do it. And so I think we have to make a decision as to whether or not we're ever going to think that it's appropriate to do a criminal disposition, and if we don't, we should take that out of the regulation and leave that to the next body of people to review the bylaw. And then my other concern is associated with who is the court of appeal, so to speak, and before it gets to the actual court. And currently that's the select board, which I have felt comfortable with as an elected body, and we haven't done too many of these luckily, but um, we have had to do that. To put it back to the public shade tree committee feels entirely inappropriate to me. So I'm, with the new form of government, we are, you know, there is no automatic one-to-one -one correspondence as the bylaw um, review committee is finding that that's supremely obvious, although they're getting really good at it, defining who would do what. It appears that it would go, rather than the select board, since it's an executive function, unless MGL states otherwise, it would go back to the town manager, which is also not an elected position, but feel is a separate person than the public shade tree committee, which I don't think is appropriate as the as the appeal of basically the public shade tree committee and the tree warden's opinion. So I don't think it should be, so I think we need to clarify that language. I appreciate that that option was offered to us, but I don't think that's the appropriate way to go. You know, another body that could serve that function is the planning board because they deal with trees. They do sometimes. scenic They do scenic stuff already, because yeah. that's already mentioned in here. And they have the advantage of being appointed by the council. So, okay, move. But that's only in a, at an appeal level, right? right Which exactly. hopefully it never gets to, well, but, but if it does. But I, I, I yeah, I see what you're saying. Well, the Shade Tree Committee's appointed by the no, it's not. Nothing's appointed by the council, basically. Oh, it's no, the planning board, zoning board. Planning right. board, zoning board. No, you're right. Thank Finance you. committee, that's really the um, council's committee. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Just an idea. I was saying maybe one way to solve the hardship waiver thing is to say someplace that the um, hardship standards um, will, will um, be promulgated and reviewed by the town manager or someplace that refers to a future schedule without having it, but let it be known that there's something that's gonna get created and that would go through our chief executive officer and so that there's something and it gives you some time without holding this up until mm. you figure out all the little nubbies of how to do yeah. it. Interesting way to do it. I think I mm -hmm. Right, because we know that the concept was in there. Are there other comments? What about the criminal disposition? What about the criminal disposition? So, do we think it's appropriate to offer both options, or do we want to just offer one? I mean, it would obviously, would be the three hundred, not the five hundred. Could it be criminal? Pardon me. When would it ever be the five hundred? If we wanted to pursue oh. criminal. Oh, for cutting a tree down. Yeah. Mr. Weld has a. I mean, I was going to assume it would always be the non-criminal disposition, but it occurred to me, I mean, what if there's something really egregious, you know, because there are lots of trees that are five inches in diameter, but what if it's a 200-year-old historic tree, uh, you know, a landmark tree, let's say, or the, the, the Grayson Elm or something like, you know, what if one really did something so outrageous that it deserved greater punishment? I don't know. But that's, again, an exceptional For case. I mean, town, town attorney does say, in my experience, it's more difficult to right. collect fines through the criminal process, mm -hmm. but she provided both options for right. your consideration. Well, I think that the, the reason for that is, I think we find that with, with um, our collection of fines relative to police action, because the police will mm -hmm. issue uh, like speeding tickets and they'll get, you know, okay. the courts can then change the amount, mm -hmm. essentially, is what happens. And so I think that's why they say that it's more difficult through the criminal, criminal process. Sometimes it weighs them all together. So um, I think that's a concern perhaps as well. Um, I mean, you can leave both in here as an option. Yeah. Well, then it's a... Yeah. The, the question is, do we want to offer that discretion or do we want to say the worst you can do to someone is 300? I, I appreciate 
point about if it's a particularly egregious thing. I think that there's a little bit of wordsmithing to be done there. There's no however that belongs in there. It's just either it's enforced this way or it's enforced that way. It's not however in accordance. But um, then that's a discretionary issue as well as to whether or not the town's going to pursue that, but the town decides whether or not to pursue things all the time. So, I, I mean, I could live with that. I don't see, I, you know, I'm reflecting back to when we had a conversation about public consumption of marijuana, right? And we said, well, let's use the same fine as we use for alcohol. And people said, no, that's too high. Um, I think this is different. And I think there might very well be a specific historic thing that we need to send a message. I, I'm not really sure what it solves if the tree's already ruined, uh, you know, at that point. But if it's somehow more of a deterrent. Well, it's a greater punishment. Tree's still gone, unfortunately. I bet most people who do that kind of act don't need this. I'm, <laughs> I'm guessing it's not much of a deterrent to that. Right. Probably. So do we want to just leave the option in and just fix the, the wording a little bit? Yeah. We're not approving today anyway, so we're... Right, but I mean it needs to be edited right. so that we right. can approve yes. it the next right. time rather than it having to redo this for the millionth criminal. time. Okay, so leave in both. Do some edits. Yeah. I mean, I think that the reason that you get into the greater difficulty with um, criminal um, prosecution fines is that there's whole layers of discretion that get then added in by potentially the district attorney and uh, <coughs> staff at the court if it goes through the magistrate hearing first and then there's a whole appeal process and does then get up to the, you know, to a judge direct, um, after that. And um, when we uh, talk about this at the, uh, uh, campus and community coalition there are times when uh, we sort of hear back that uh, the judges will not um, pursue some of the fees the fines as greatly as we might have thought that they would and that that's the judge's discretion uh, and uh, maybe the judges and be kinder than we are. Who knows? Well, they see a lot more hardcore <clears throat> stuff. That's kind of so it, it, that's why it becomes more complicated. But uh, it uh, to leave the option in there and uh, in the really egregious situation, as Mr. Wald described earlier, uh, it may be that in consultation with uh, the various players that a case can be made that it's an appropriate action to take because they cut down the Mary Maple. I was going to say the Mary Maple would be the perfect example. I, yeah. Okay. I think I got all the comments. All right. Anything else? Yes, Ms. Brewer. Would you send us the Word version that's in the new format? Mm -hmm. And then we can check and make sure we feel like, I mean, I can send you some the really simple red line things. Sure. And who knows, maybe somebody else will want to do that too. All right. So I think we've fatigued that one. Mm -hmm. um, so next on our agenda is uh, state and town election warrants for the election on November 6th. We've got uh, a memo from, I believe, the uh, board of registrars? No, from the clerk. So if you want to take us through that and I think this is. You have two election warrants that typically that you receive and then you have to sign them. You have the sign in your sign folder. Um, so this comes from the town clerk and it's just pretty standard thing so she can post the warrant and get the, um, uh, get them posted. And so the public know, it gives advance warning to the public that there are there are two elections coming up. Were there any questions relative to those notices? And if not, then I would uh, entertain the appropriate motion relative to those motions.
we have that. motions. Oh, wait, yes, we do. We have one motion Steering for both. We have um, four F. Do you want to read it? I'll yeah. move 4F. Move to authorize the warrant for the town and state elections, November 6, 2018. Second. So we have a motion and a second? Yeah, that's where I'm trying to find it. What's the question? I remember it was stapled to something else. It was the shade tree, I thought it was. It was something stapled to a weird thing. Yes, it yeah. was stapled to the shade tree. Yes, just to keep us guessing. <laughs> As was the letter about voting day in yeah. Crocker Farm School. Shady. That's stapled to shade tree information. So we have a motion. And it has been seconded. Is there further discussion on the things that... The only, the only thing, um, it doesn't change the motion, but I wonder if we might include it in our minutes reflecting this last letter that's attached here, which is that the voting day is, is obviously the voting day because it's the state voting day, but that it's actually a professional development day in the schools. And so um, we won't be, ha something along, something shows that that's been addressed by the schools for that particular election and that then they're on, we know there are ongoing conversations about that moving forward. So yes, it, the, the conflict that has arisen in past elections and we've heard notice from, um, from various schools uh, is resolved for this election by virtue of the fact that, right. like you say, it's professional development day so only adults will be in the building or exclus almost exclusively adults will be in the building. Um, is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous. It is now set. Encourage people to vote. Do you have things to sign relative so to that? Guyful paper. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. So that takes care of that. Um, so next on our agenda is charter transition update and topics for future council. Yes. Share some things with us, Mr. Depp. Um, so the uh, bylaw review committee has uh, continues to meet. Uh, they sent an invitation to the members of the board if any of you are interested in uh, meeting with them to convey thoughts that you may have. They're meeting pretty much weekly during October. They are meeting at the end of the month uh, with former Senator, Senate President Rosenberg to gather his knowledge um, and um, so there are, I think there's an actual letter with actual dates of their meetings, and if there's other dates uh, uh, going into November that you'd like to meet, I think they could probably accommodate you, but I think they're trying to wrap up their, their business. And just let me or Jeff Kravitz, the staff person, know what, is your, what your desire is for that. Um, if you look on the floor, you will see um, tape on the floor, and this is going to be, this is the outline for the new council uh, uh, seating area this is going to be built into the this tomorrow and Thursday tomorrow and Wednesday they're going to be building a wall that will eventually accommodate uh, desks for 13 people to sit at in pretty much this kind of configuration we we took this vision where um, you could everybody can see each other as best as possible versus uh, I'm told that the, the people used to sit lengthwise up here um, but yep. I know that that's a problem that you can't see each other and, you, and the whole purpose of the council is to be able to have a conversation together. So this, we sort of scoped it out and tried to figure out how many people we could, how we could get 13 people here. We've looked at lots of different setups at different communities and reserve enough seating for the vast members of the public who want to come, but there will be more. Um, where, where does the staff go? The staff will be at a separate table. Oh, they'll have a table. They'll have a, there'll be a, a table like this f for people presenting to the council and then the staff have a separate table. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about was should the manager be like this or not? And I think in reflecting on it, it was pretty obvious that the council is the council. That's our legislative forum and they are independent of the, of the manager forum. So um, even though the manager serves the council, but 
we thought it was, it was more important for the manager and other staff to be set aside uh, so the council could con conduct its business. Um, and that's sort of the, the layout. Now, this room back here, which is usually just um, storage, uh, the intent is to put a wall there and have a doorway and have a place for council members to come in um, if they have um, an umbrella or a jacket they want to hang up, there'd be a place back there. If they need to take a phone call, they don't have to walk out into the hall into where, all the, where people are. They can take a phone call back there. Um, I know one community we were in, they had a table with chairs, but then they found out too many counselors were gathering back there at one time. So those, they took out enough chairs so it never created a quorum. <laughs> But, you know, so if, if you are running late from the meeting or if you're, you come to the meeting, you're here 10 minutes early, you don't want to eat in front of everybody, you can just sit back there and just serve sort of some time. So there'll be a space, and maybe, and we might put, we'll put, well, I'm not sure what we'll put back there, you know, coffee Council machine. chambers of a sort. Yeah, yeah an antechambers, we call right, it, yeah. Right, right. The green yeah. room. It's where, the, yes. it's where the robes will hang. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, there will be no platform. You know, the people, someone asked if the, the council is going to be raised. No, the council will not be raised. It, it just presents a lot of ADA issues if we did. Um, the one thing the uh, building inspector asked is if we can, the, the white tape is pretty detailed. If you don't, if you can avoid rolling over it and screwing that up, because that's what they're really building on. The way that we're doing it, we're using our internal staff who are really excited about doing it to build as much as we can. We have the carpenter from the DPW and a facilities person from our facility staff teaming up to build the sort of rough construction part of it. Uh, then we are we have a couple of fine finish carpenters who happen to be building inspectors who've asked if they can do the fine finish work because they want to take pride in the work. And that's really exciting for us because um, we thought we were going to have to contract this out, but we're, are, are, we happen to have a lot of talent on our staff in the inspections department who are taking this on as a project themselves. We have obviously have gotten all the permits that we need. Um, the the uh, IT department is organizing the technology. We will have all brand new technology in here, just taking the opportunity to upgrade everything because this is also uh, utilizing some of the, the um, uh, the, what uh, Amherst Media was going to do anyway under our new contract, so uh, upgrading our uh, technology so there will be screens on both sides, so wherever you're sitting in the audience or as a member of the council, you'll be able to see uh, the, the, the screen that's being used. We're hoping to use screens a lot more often and to have them on regularly, so at, least, at the worst case, the, the agenda is presented or you'll see something what, so people can sort of follow along if they're uh, having a hard time hearing, they can see where we are. So making that as a normal part of our meeting. Um, so that's sort of, you know, we think we can get 60 seats in here. I think it's going to be a little tight with 60, but um, there's there's about 50 in here now. So um, if we put them tight, we can get 60. Do it like they do at stadiums where it's been seating and everybody gets, you know, like 14 inches yeah, just, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, right. <laughs> so the, I think the meeting space might be a little bit narrower than this, just because it might be 30 inches, I think it is. But, um, but it need, we need, we were pretty clear that most people from other councils, that some councils had just tables and people wanted their own private space. They needed a little divider or something that indicated this is my space and you're not spreading out into my space. And that was, that was a, a feedback that some council, uh, some town managers had gotten from their council members after they built it. So we're going to try to do some divider. Might not happen right away because we're sort of pushing to get this done as quickly as possible. You know, finish nothing fancy. It's going to be pretty simple, pretty plain. Um, but I think our our people will take good pride, you know, pride in in constructing it ourselves. So that's really exciting, and that's why you see the wood here. Um, this they will have the wall up without the finish work. Uh, in a couple of days, it won't. It will mean that we will Closer. will be meeting inside the the wall, um, <laughs> or we'll be can meet in, outside it, but more likely inside. And so meetings will continue to be able to go on here uh, during the course. But we've also um, freed up uh, rooms at the Jones Library and the Bank Center and the community room at the police station to, to in case the space is not available during construction period. Uh, those rooms are all going to be available, and we're going to accommodate meetings that are going on regularly anyway. Um, Let's clean the wall. Hmm? Confused by the wall. 
I, I, I call it a wall. It's really the, like if you say that's a wall. Okay. That's, that's, that's what that's the a wall. Framing the framing yes. of it, yeah. Okay. I, the, building, you know, the building commissioner called it a wall. That's why I call it a wall. Yeah. The, the framing of the seating area. Yes. I'm saying. And then yeah. Everything got it. is built on <coughs> Like a yeah. kitchen cap, you know, your kitchen right. island. Right. Structural part, and then you add the. Right. build a wall make Hadley pay for it but, uh, <laughs> and I'm envious of course that they get a clubhouse and we don't but my actual question but was you mass should pay for it <laughs> was something different is there going to be a designated press area and enforced we have a table in the, the back presence? of the room uh, that's a movable table and the, the staff table and the, and the mm -hmm. visitors table and the um, this press table are all movable mm -hmm. so if there's something else going on in here we need to get those out of the way we will this will be structural right. um, for two good for re two reasons. One was um, we just didn't want Mary pulling in 13 of these things and mm -hmm. pulling them out. And also for the technology, it makes a, a yeah. lot of difference for Amherst Media that the the, the technology will be will be buried mm -hmm. and plugged in. They don't have to assemble this every time. Right. Um, and because there's fixed seating, when they uh, assign their cameras, they can just say seat six, seat five. They don't have to refocus on whoever's right. speaking. They can just hit a button and it'll reprogram to whoever that's, who happens to be sitting in that seat. So there are a lot of advantages to having fixed seating mm -hmm. for broadcast. And if we do remote broadcast, which we hope to get to, where we don't need someone physically here, uh, there'll be a, a camera in the back of the room that can just be on mm -hmm. and we can activate that. And that's where we want to be so that wherever we want, the goal would be to have every meeting broadcast or recorded at least, maybe not broadcast live, but recorded. Right. And some communities have achieved that and that's, I think that would be a really good goal for us to say every meeting is recorded and you can watch it on, on online. The press, I, I just meant, you know, we had some issues occasionally with the press not being identified or the press wandering around and taking pictures and so forth. Yep. And it might be a good opportunity to uh, cultivate an understanding of what the expectations are, for, especially because I assume that mm -hmm. with the new council, there'll be a lot more interest. Maybe other press uh, groups will start covering again. I was just a little confused but by what you said about um, meetings. So obviously all the council meetings yep. would be broadcast, but once there's this fixed furniture arrangement <clears throat> in place, then how does planning board and other bodies that normally work fit here and Will they continue to meet here? Probably. And you're talking about, I mean, we already do a number of those meetings, but you're just saying there could, whatever meetings are held in here, in addition to council meetings, we could also tape then mm -hmm. with the fixed setup. Yeah. So two, two answers. One is the, the ZBA or the planning board, any board could still meet in the same setup. Right. And actually it'd be a better format than having your back, if you sit at a table and you have your back, but they can still, there'll be 13, there's no board that's, well, maybe Kanakasaki or somebody like that, but there's <laughs> right. very few boards that are larger than 13. Right. You just so wouldn't still use fit. all of them, right? right. You could spread mm -hmm. out a little bit more. Um, in terms of what I was talking about, in terms of recording meetings, Amherst Media's by contract right. has to record meetings, but the, the other meetings, suppose we have a public shade tree committee right. hearing, right. Um, they may not be here, but what we'd like to be able to do is have it, any, any staff person right. can come in, put in their code and record the meeting and, and you know, code out when you're finished and then that gets uploaded the next day to the website. That's, that's how, how I've seen other communities do it. So that it's a, and we'd like to do that with multiple rooms. So that's every, every meet right now, you see the finance committee, the way they meet now, and, the, and they bring in their portable stuff. You know, we can put something on that just, it's a fixed thing. They don't, it won't, you won't get the, zoom in on who's speaking but it'll record because it you don't have to wait till some communities minutes are posted when you want to find out what happened at right. that meeting. yeah you want to, you can go look at it so that's the stuff happening here you'll see i mean you see it already you'll see more of it next week i'm not sure exactly how this configuration will work going forward um but we'll we'll figure it out i mean we what we might do is we might even relocate our ourselves over there and mm -hmm. have seating up this way so we just haven't i don't really know how, how chairs in the framework no place to yeah. like set I mean, our stuff this, <laughs> well mike's kind of dangling from no, the but we frame could, we could move this whole setup uh, against right. that wall right, right. we're um, kind of on the line here on this side yeah. we're, we're, I mean, we'll be all right. there might be room yeah um so uh a few other th i have a lot of other things uh the board of license commissioners um 
we are looking at staffing for that. that again, I mentioned to you previously that this would be, uh, the, we're trying to con consolidate all the licensing functions on the second floor. We are negotiating with our union and we'll be presenting some organizational concepts to the personnel board at their next meeting. Um, and so there, there are a number of things that we're putting into play on that, but that is the first commission that has to be up and running. And that's where the organization of it will, will happen. It'll be on the second floor. Um, for the council, we've, I have um, asked the council candidates to hold November 19th and 29th for possible meetings. Uh, why those two dates? When you look at the calendar, the townwide calendar, your meeting a lot of Monday, a lot of Mondays during that week. There is um, there, there are two sets of holidays during the week. I just chose two dates that were late enough after the uh, council election should be determined, plus account, accounting for a possible recount, um, and that also all um, voted council members could be present for those first two meetings. The, those two meetings are the councils permitted before they're actually sworn in officially, but they would be sworn in some way to um, to take action on Ill, uh, choosing a chair, or a president, and vice president of the council to meet with the uh, the bylaw review committee uh, and to start to review applicants for the license commission. Those are the three actions that they're allowed to start to to take. Um, in addition, I've scheduled the, our town attorney to come in on November 29th to do a training for state ethics law, open meeting law, and public records law. I think it's really important for our counselors to get that training up front. That's also probably the date that we'll have our bylaw review committee come in because town attorney will be here anyway. Um, I'm assuming that the first day, their first official meeting will be um, December 3rd. Uh, which is the m first Monday in December. Uh, and there, the swearing in would be December 2nd at 1 p.m. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And that we have sort of are holding a day, not sure what time of day, uh, of December 1st for the select board's final meeting. Um, in terms of the um, actual event for uh, the swearing in, uh, I've convened a number of people, including the chair. Um, I've reached out to um, former Senate President Rosenberg, the chair of the um, Charter Commission, um, uh, Tony Morales from UMass, and Sarah LaCour from the bid as being good people who know about venues. Um, and it's sort of a sounding board, along with s several staff members um, who are doing a, 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 the load of the work in organizing this day. Uh, December 2nd is the, is the date. It's the first day of Hanukkah. Uh, we chose 1 p.m. as being a good start date, thinking the, uh, the actual swearing in would be about 60 to 90 minutes, and then there'd be a reception of 60 to 90 minutes after that. Uh, so that we'd be finished by 4 p.m. As I mentioned, the Patriots also play at 4.15 that day. Um, that's a holy day. That's a holy day, <laughs> um, the, um, the the group felt like doing it at the high school auditorium uh, would, was the right venue for it. It's, it, it's large enough. I, was, I thought, I didn't anticipate many people, but others felt like there would be a fair number of people who may show up and we should be able to accommodate them. And then I think the last time I talked to you, we talked about having some kind of reception someplace else, but the group felt like we should just move to the cafeteria and have a nice reception in the cafeteria, not and have it be more inclusive, welcoming, making people feel like they could come in and partake in this. Um, it's a solemn occasion, it's a celebratory occasion, it's celebrating the peaceful transition of government. Um, and, uh, but it's also a, an important day. And so, so pulling all these things together, uh, we're talking about an event that will look something like um, the um, we'd have the a um, an MC of some sort. No names have have been finalized on any of this. An MC of sort. Uh, there would be a um, maybe a um, reflection on the day that might be from a minister or somebody like that. Um, there'd be the chair 
the current chair of the select board uh, would give some remarks. If there is a president of the council, maybe the president of the council would give some remarks. Um, we'd have a judge here to do the swearing in uh, of the councilors. Um, there'd be uh, some entertainment, uh, multiple places, people to entertain, to commemorate uh, the day. Um, and that there would be some kind of keynote speaker or something. Um, some debate whether the town manager should actually speak or not. That's, the people have gone back and forth on that. Um, I'm happy not to, but uh, others feel like that that's, there's some way that that can be done that um, recognizes the staff's role in the operations of government. Um, we also want to recognize the role of nonprofits and volunteers in the operations of government. It's not just about the elected officials on stage. It's also a celebration of how government <coughs> works in the town of Amherst. Um, All in 90 minutes. Yeah, I know. Um, we are looking at this as an as a important event in that it's uh, everything that we do we want to archive so that cause, because I think this is going this is something that Senator Rosenberg noted this is important we should people will come back and look at how we did things and what was said and thought about during those times so we should gather that information uh, they checked out the technology today and found out we can do live streaming uh, of the event in case people are not able to go or choose not to attend so we will be able to broadcast live uh, the act actual goings on um, you know, a lot of details. Angela's in the thick of it and thinking of, of good people to speak and uh, participate and um, all the details that go into organizing something like this. So we're uh, very, um, so I want to convey that to you so you know that there is some activity, there is some thought going into it. Um, and I, if you want to convey any thoughts to me or the chair, um, welcome to that. Um, Say anything else? That's pretty much the update on that type of thing at this point in time. Meeting Thursday. Yeah. We'll probably meet about every week. Yeah. I think just because it'll require that. Uh, did you already have the judge picked out? There was a judge that was recommended. Okay, because there's some people who live in town. Judges. Yeah, I would love to I'll talk, talk to you offline. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask, is that you just encourage everyone to yeah. talk to you offline. Because I, I don't no one has been, no, I, uh, people have been approached, but no one has, the group hasn't met to say, okay. here are the people. All right, and I'll talk to you separately. Yeah. Any questions? So that kind of covers. Um, oh, yes. this question. How, 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 I've been telling a couple people, save, save the date, I didn't know the time, but I guess mm. midday. So how are we gonna start? I mean, this is it's really a, open to the public now. Yes, so. that's a really good point. Um, we just, we did a mock-up today of the save the date email okay. and public thing that we can send out to people. We'll do a more formal printed invitation to people as well. Um, we wanna make sure we reach out to the nonprofit community, to the, everybody that makes Amherst the, the place it is. <clears throat> so we wanna make sure everybody, every group, every committee gets invited with a hard copy, something that we'll probably produce internally because we don't have a budget really for this. <laughs> that's what because I would, that's how we do it too. Um, but we have some designs now of, of inviting some wording that just that got done today. So we, uh, Angela's done up a, a time schedule to, so that we know we gotta get some things out like this week, next week, mm -hmm. week after. Uh, we have confirmations, or at least on the schedules, for the two president, the three, the two presidents and the chancellor, the presence of the two colleges and the chancellor. Um, I think that's. And then uh, we've also notified our elected and pro um, candidates for state and federal office uh, as well. Not all the candidates for federal office, but um, the the incumbents of our federal offices about the event coming up, and the governor, of course, has been invited to attend. Other questions, comments? Don't hesitate to funnel ideas to either myself or the, yeah. the manager. Please. Because there's no, there's no bad ideas. Just oh, yes, it's more about are. editing. Yes, there are. Well, there are bad <laughs> ideas. But, <laughs> but we want to entertain as, as many as we can, ideas good and bad. And then obviously there's a, a process of editing that we're going 
going to go through to it's really good, man. make it a, a sane afternoon. Yes. While you're making notes, I think it would be great that one of the many speakers um, encourage the audience to be recognized in terms of former town managers, former select board members, and former town meeting members. Perhaps school com school committee is going to stay, but the the things that will no longer moderators things that will no longer exist um, under the new form of government, just to show, again, how many different people have been engaged mm -hmm. over the years. Just, you know, not listing them all by name. <laughs> that would take most of the 90 minutes right there. But one of those recognition things, stand up, everyone clap for you kind of thing. Excellent. So if there's not anything further on that at the moment, um, why don't we move on to section six, which is a resolution and proclamation. We actually have a, a proclamation and flag raising uh, item on our agenda today. And if I can locate it in your packet, there was a, a different version than what will be signed because there was a spelling error that was corrected. Um, but, Here. Um, I could make the motion. If you would be so kind. I move to proclaim November 2018, November, yeah, we're just going to say November. I move to proclaim November as Puerto Rican month and in recognition thereof, permit the Puerto Rican flag to be flown below the UN flag on the North Common from November 19th, 2018 through November 30th, 2018. Is there a second? Second. And I will just go on to say that those dates were specified by the requester as opposed to us making up those dates. So they could have had the entire month of November. They chose right. those dates. Our one flag exception. Mr. Wall. I was just uh, noticing, I assume this is thanks to Ms. Mills that we have this update about the hurricane here. Is that, uh, we, it says here, we have you know, a biz, we, we wrote letters also last year about hurricane relief and things like that. And so I noticed that here we've usually this is a boilerplate text, but we have whereas the residents of Amherst wish to express our support for the residents of Puerto Rico who are still recovering from the devastation of Hurricane Maria. That's mm -hmm. a nice addition. I'm glad we have that there. Absolutely. Absolutely. I noticed that as well, and I was appreciative of that being added. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous. Um, and we will have, have one to sign. we have one to sign in our in our folder. Um, next on our agenda, blocking pages. Uh, we move into section seven, which is licenses public way metered parking reservations. We have a consent calendar, and we have uh, annual license renewals on our agenda for this evening. And so, if someone, if anyone has anything in the consent calendar, there were some late additions in our uh, on our desk tonight. There were. Uh, a couple of those um, and so if we can either um, move the consent calendar or if we need to put some out we can do that uh, so I'm going to abstain if it's if the application that relates to me is in the consent calendar if you want to pull it out I'll only abstain from that vote so it doesn't really matter to me not a big deal. So I think that we'll do the license renewals as a separate motion, I think. So that would be the one. Okay. I believe it's a separate motion. It's not part of the consent. Right. I think that's correct. Yeah, it's, it's a separate motion <clears throat> for the license renewals. So we will we'll note that. Oh, I see. Okay. And D. It's added as 7D. Right. It's 7D it. as in. Okay. I'm Yes. I'm sorry, I'm confused. Um, I realized some changes were made, but it's 7D was added. It's got yellow highlighting. Mm -hmm. If I look at the revised sheet, there's n not should, yellow highlighting. It should be. I'm just wondering where Cherry Hill fits in. Cherry Hill has its own separate common vic, but it's listed right. under license it's, renewals here. Yeah, actually, but seven. What? Like, seven just lost. So I think that B, when we, I think when we started, B was the only annual renewal, and then we got some others, 
And so those that are under D are actually technically under 7B because there's no D on our agenda. <laughs> Right? right, it goes right. seven right. A, B, and C. So the no, annual okay. license renewals includes Cherry Hill with its own separate motion, and then a more generic um, motion for the other two uh, license renewals. Why? I think, I think just we just funny. messed up. So maybe we could just separate them and just quick and vote them, those three. And right. then all the rest be under the consent. So the consent story. So the consent, the consent, consent counter is the top part. The, 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 the consent counter is only the top part. We could separate the other three. They're they're their are own separated. motion. They are sort of. They have their own motion. Well, yeah. one of them separated, and the other two are separated into a yellow. Right. Motion. So we could we can have three motions, instead of two. But I, the consent calendar is just for the one day licenses, yes. I think. And so if there aren't any oh. issues with any of those, I'd be happy I to entertain the motion on that. The move to authorize the special one day licenses is listed on the attachment 7A consent calendar. Is there a second? Second. So a motion is second uh, to approve the consent calendar, which is all about one day licenses. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 So it's unanimous. And so I think we can take the Annual so, renewals. So that got all of these, right? Right. That got all of that section. One to twelve. One to thirteen. 13. Yeah, that's correct. And then under what sort of D or e. sort of B? Right. Well, we could do those in move, turn. Move to approve the annual renewal of the common vitular license for Cherry Hill Golf Course, 323 Montague Road, Barbara Bill, Supervisor Director. Second. And so there's a second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Seven. B, we could do the other two. I'd like to do them separately because okay. they're two different kinds of licenses and since we don't have a million of them. Feel so free. I move to approve the annual renewal of the common victualler license for Momo's Tibetan Restaurant, 23 North Pleasant Street, um, Jam Yang Wang Chun, whose name I just botched, manager. There's a second. Second. Yes. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous. And if you would and care to offer the. also move to approve the annual renewal of the in holder license for Hotbrook BB, 15 Hotbrook Road, Connie Kruger Manager. Second. Motion and second. Further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Abstain. And one abstention. So we have a four to zero with one abstention. <laughs> and so that takes care of section seven. Shall we do the minutes or shall we go to reports? Why don't we do minutes? Just since we're on a roll of approving you know things. Change of government, you should get so we have three sets of minutes, I believe. If I can find my motion. Were there any um, additional comments relative or, or changes to minutes? Yes, there was. Oh, um, please. On uh, the minutes for the meeting that was held on September 18, of 2017, there was a number of motions that are listed throughout, uh, made and seconded, but there was no vote recorded for any of those motions in that set of draft minutes. And um, I think that I had alerted uh, Mr. Bachman and Ms. Mills to this earlier in the day, and Mr. Bachman said he would be prepared to respond. <laughs> Supplement. Oh, it just says, you know, Ms. Oh, Brewer yeah, made yeah. a motion second by Mr. Wald. It gives the motion, but it doesn't say that we ever voted. So, <laughs> oh, but yeah, others, others are looked at. Just yeah, that, yeah. So may, if we could bring these back and fix them so they All right. read properly. So why don't we, yeah. if we make a motion to approve minutes, we'll exclude the September 18th, 2017? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> need a little bit more energy. Yeah. All right, so if someone would like to make the motion on the approval of minutes. 
with the exception of September 18th. So on the back page of the motion sheet, so it's the very back. Yeah. Um, I move to approve the minutes for the select board meetings of September 17, 2016 and October 23, 2017. I think is where we are then. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? There is. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, abstaining? So that's unanimous for those. All right. through that. So we're now into reports and, and comments. Um, Mr. Bachman, would you like to share with us your manager's report? Mm -hmm. First, I'd like to um, thank the UMass students who participated in the um, Student Impact Day. They, uh, dozens of students showed up at various locations on, in public and private venues. Uh, one that we paid special attention to was Market's Pond, uh, where a lot of students showed up to help clear um, brush and lay um, wood chips on paths and things like that. Um, it was a rainy morning. Uh, the chair gave the blessing to go <laughs> forth and <laughs> prosper. Sprinkled them with <laughs> That's right. Um, which you can comment on whenever you're ready to. Um, but uh, I talked to, uh, they were down at Sunset Farm. I talked to um, uh, Mr. Gillen uh, yesterday and he said he had a dozen students there doing things for him to help get that area cleaned up. And so they're all over the place doing uh, lots of different things for the town. So, and they were in the library, uh, dusting shelves and shelving books and all kinds of things. So we thank the university for organizing this, um, and hope that they continue it, could continue it frequently. Um, on Friday, I'll be at Jake's since they were just here uh, for a cup of Joe with Paul and with Sup uh, DPW Superintendent Guilford Mooring will be with me, and we'll be there from 7:30 to 9 and anticipate a large number of people to show up because we're very popular in <laughs> North Amherst at this moment in time. <laughs> I thought it was because the coffee's so good. Well, their food is good, I know that. Um, the uh, next Cup of Joe will be on November 9th, I think it is, and that's going to be at UMass, first time going outside of our uh, sort of normal venue. Several people have asked if we could hold one at, on the campus, so that'll be the Friday after the election, so it'll be an interesting time and we'll be at the um, Post and Bean, I think it's called, Coffee House in the Isles Building, I believe it is. I don't know, I'm not sure, I haven't been there, so. Um, the, um, you in your packet, I believe we put in a correspondence, or maybe I just reported on it, that the Jones Library has taken an initiative. So Jones Library, Inc. had been historically doing a fundraiser and the Friends of Jones Library were doing a fundraiser. They have worked together, have created a memorandum of understanding between the two organizations, so though people from now on will receive just one request for funds from the Jones Library. The funds will be managed by the Friends, I believe the way it's set up, um, but and will be administered jointly. And uh, so I think that's a real smart thing for the library to do because as they develop a more rational approach to fundraising, which people uh, really want to donate to the Jones. And so it's a good way, and people get confused because I, I, I just got a, an appeal from the, from the library director. Why am I getting one from the friends? Aren't, they, aren't you one and the same? And there was confusion out there. So kudos to them for coming up with a, a, a workable solution. Um, there is a, the assistant town manager attended a, um, District One Neighborhood Association meeting um, a couple weeks ago. There's another one scheduled for this Sunday at 3 p.m. Um, and there will not be staff present at that meeting because none of us are able to attend, but also has pointed up, and you know, we were very eager to attend neighborhood meetings, but this, this group is very active, very organized, and they've been holding lots of them and are fairly frequently. And it's going to, it's a, they're a model, I think, for other neighborhoods and how they could organize themselves, but it's also 
um, something that we're going to have to manage in terms of staff present presence at a lot of these things. We um, we can't overload one neighborhood. A, a lot of their, their best times for meetings are Sundays afternoon, and that's sometimes hard for our staff to take off time from their family to go to the neighborhood meetings. They're usually very willing if they don't have a prior commitment. So um, we've done two of them up there, and I think that'll be it for, uh, for the time being. Mm -hmm. I don't wish to derail you because you do yep. such a great job of racing no, no. through everything. I do but race. I just want to make sure I point it out to everybody that Mr. Zomek spent 45 minutes the first time, I think, 30 minutes the second time, presenting and answering questions. And really, people really appreciated it. But I mean, it was a chunk out of his day. He did that both in August and again in September. And so it is great to see the neighborhood association start to form. But I really appreciate also what you're saying. And I think that the group does as well, that mm -hmm. they recognize they can't get Mr. Zoic to come and talk for half an hour every chance, the, every opportunity they have. So that will be a, a new challenge mm -hmm. for you to figure out right. how you can support those things effectively without sending people from one thing to the next to the next on weekends, as well as all the weeknights and all the days that we already do. Thank you for noting that. And also, um, a lot of the things that people want to talk about are actually better discussed at a different venue. For instance, if they want to talk about traffic on East Pleasant Street, it really is the tack that where that conversation needs to happen. We can tell them certain things, but the, really the, the guiding force on that is going to be the Transportation Advisory Committee. So helping to say, well, what is it that you want to talk about? If it's just information sharing, we can do that. But if it's that you want to convey feel, you know, opinions, it really is the Advisory Committee that really should be the place that you're uh, um, communicating that to. Um, I think I've no noted that in the Business Improvement District uh, was up for renewal. And on last Friday, they had the vote. And it was 50 to 4 in favor of renewal. So that's an overwhelming vote and a vote of confidence in the bid. So that, that's congratulations to the bid board and the uh, executive director for organizing that. Um, the the, the Crosstown sculpture uh, that's been very popular and, and really well received um, has, um, is scheduled to come down by the end of this month. One of the um, owners of one of the pieces has asked through the Public Art Commission if, they, if we would like to keep it up for another year. So I'm looking at that. Um, one of the things I liked about the uh, Crosstown group was that UMass had backed everything on it. So if there were any issues, UMass was there and they had the liability insurance and they had the commitment that the pieces would be removed. So without UMass's backing, I need to be very careful about this. Uh, as I talked with the Public Art Commission chair, um, this isn't how we install public art in the town. And if you happen to like it, great. If you don't happen to like it, and, and I would not trust my judgment on public art. And so I think that if, we, if this was a new proposal and someone wanted to put a piece of public art, you'd want the full Public Art Commission to weigh in, the community, the community to weigh in. It can't come in, you know, as a, and I don't think this was the intent. I think it's more um, the, the opportunity is there. But I, I don't want to say, yes, you can have it there for six months and then say, hey, now it's there forever, because I just don't, that hopefully that that's not the way we do things. It's a slippery slope with these yeah. things. Yeah. Um, the early voting uh, um, is about to kick off. Um, really, con Margaret Nardowitz has been all over this and uh, really done a tremendous job and has really committed her whole entire staff's resources and the Board of Registrars to making sure that early voting happens effectively. So there will be early voting for the two weeks prior to um, the election. Every day the town hall is open from uh, 8 to 4.30. So you can come into town hall vote no, you don't have to fill out any papers uh, and on there's there's also three days uh, the I don't have the dates in front of me, the 25th 26th 27th I think it is of October that will five and six uh, it's Wednesday Thursday Friday Wednesday Thursday Friday 24th 25th 26th will be at the UMass Student Union if you want to vote at the Student Union it's going to be on the second floor of the Student Union so you walk into the Student Union and you go upstairs and there's there'll be people there directing you to how to get there and then on Saturday the 27th uh, from 9 to 3 you'll be able to either go to Munson Memorial Library or to the North Fire Station 
So uh, she has done a tremendous job on this and building on the work that was done uh, in prior years. So there really is no excuse not to vote. And it's better to vote early just because you don't know what the weather's going to be like on November 6th and just get it out of the way. You can come in. You can vote. If you want to vote absentee, you can do that as well. It's a slightly different process. But otherwise, it's set up just like a normal voting day. You come in. You tell them that you're registered to vote and they check you, your name off the list. Anybody can vote in any of these locations. Uh, the UMass locations is not reserved for students. It's for anybody in the community that can go there. Uh, and anybody, can, in, anybody in any district or ward can vote, or precinct, I'm sorry, using wrong terminology here, you can go to, um, uh, go to the North Station, go to the Munson Library, or come to Town Hall to vote. So. Uh, Town Hall, 8 to 4.30. These are the locations, 9 to 3 on the, on the Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and then the Saturday. Um, along those same lines, you did have the letter from the school committee about Crocker Farm, and that's on our list to start to explore different options for voting locations. Uh, the town clerk, the new town clerk, has lots of different ideas for this. So. It won't happen right away, but we've got a bit of time before this comes up again, before we'll have another election. Um, so, but it is on her mind. And there have been a number of people who have expressed concern about having voting locations in schools. It's just a hard place. It's hard to find a good uh, accessible location, and the board, has, you have talked about this previously. Um, the fire department had its open house uh, on Saturday, and even though it was kind of rainy, there were a fair number of people there. A lot of people thought it was a good place to bring their kids out of the rain because they had donuts and a lot of activities there. And it's part of Fire Prevention Week, so they, they're doing a lot of education, and that's the whole purpose of it. Uh, so thanks to the fire department for pulling that off. They basically do it on a, hardly any budget at all. And they don't hire people to come in to work it. It's all uh, cur people currently on staff who are working it. Um, on the police side, I attended the meeting with the landlords. Every year, the, the police have a meeting with all the landlords and the property managers of the major apartment complexes. And in that meeting, we have the fire department, we have the building inspectors, the health inspectors, um, and UMass uh, st student services are, are there. So everybody gets on the same page, and we get uh, talking to each other about what are the behavior expectations, when should the police be called, what will the police do when they arrive, um, what are the problems that, um, that property owners have, um, and it was really good to hear some of the challenges that they're faced because a lot of property owners say there's, we don't have a lot, <clears throat> while we put things in our lease, if someone breaks a lease it takes us months <coughs> to get rid of them and then they're graduated anyway, so they, they were expressing their own frustrations on, on certain behavior things. Um, but I think every, every year it gets better and better. Um, in your packet you notice there is a um, flyer for the Puffers Pond walking tours. This is to talk about parking and the road direction of State Street. So anybody who's interested on that in joining the DPW superintendent and the assistant town manager, Mr. Zomek, on October 17th, which is Wednesday at 4 p.m., or October 25th, uh, the next week at 5 p.m., meet at the Puffers Pond Main Beach, and we'll, we'll do a sort of a walking area with maps and show you what the idea is, uh, because that will be coming up back to the select board and for further consideration down the line. We want to start getting it out, talking with people who live there on a regular basis and get their feedback, see what they think. If it's, maybe it's a stupid idea, maybe it's a great idea, we don't know. Um, well, we do know. We think it's a good idea. Um, <laughs> otherwise, we wouldn't no, be proposing it. Um, but people may say you're off, off base on that. Um, really good news is that we've been designated as CDBG mini entitlement community again, which is really important because what that means is that we get a fixed sum of money from the state through the, feder through, th through the state from the federal government. Um, if we weren't a mini entitlement community, it would mean that we would have to compete with applications for specific projects to the state, and um, having that designation is, is critical to how we're able to do a lot of our programming in town. Um, we've advertised for the finance director position, and we have interviewed uh, the, the interview team, which includes a member of the finance committee, the school business manager, the town clerk, um, 
think that's an HR director. Um, well, I'm I'm an observer oh. with a, with the comptroller and with the um, principal assessor. We're we're in the background. We're not we're not visible during the interview. Um, we have one of those one way mirrors. It's, it's a really important job. So we, we I, I felt like the more access we have, or that our key department heads have to the person, the people who are interviewing for it. So we had five interviews so far. Um, we're still at it. So just that, that's an active process, though. Um, the uh, we went out to bid for property and casualty insurance, and we are we as of October one, we've switched our company. We used to use Encharter, which we liked using because they were local, uh, but a company um, Hub International um, sub were substantially lower at at better coverage and equal quality in terms of the um, the companies that are backing their their insurance policy. We also had a bid from Maya. And, but we chose the hub group as being the ones that are going to take our business, we're going to give them this business for the coming year. Um, so it was really price driven because they were giving us quality coverage at a substantially lower price. Um, Farmers Market, uh, I'm not sure if you've re they've reached out to you yet, they were going to. They are looking to have some uh, Apparently, Blue Cross Blue Shield is reaching out to multiple um, farmers markets and saying, we'd like to sponsor you, or not in a really overt way, but just they like, it's part of their healthy eating campaign. You should go to farmers markets. So we'll be, they'll be, they were asking the chair to participate in a sort of public announcement of that probably in a week or two. Um, so it's basically, they just say, here's some money to support farmers markets. We think some farmers markets are good. Um, so that's a good thing for them. Um, about that. Oh, we received, oh, no, we didn't receive. We've got notice that there will be an announcement tomorrow of a grant um, for um, community compact um, for, docu for uh, IT services and uh, so I'm very eager to hear the announcement. Um, what we applied for was a document management uh, software and a, and a process to help manage the um, documents for the new council and for any other boards and committees and to um, engage in making sure things that you've been talking about for a long time, but this would give us funds to actually buy something that, that, we, that um, would work for, for everybody. So we're eager to hear that announcement that's scheduled for tomorrow. Um, and lastly, um, so this came in late this afternoon. So this is regarding the Station Road bridge replacement. Um, so, when, as you all know, the Station Road Bridge has been has closed. Um, it was constructed in the 50s. Uh, the deck of the bridge was replaced in 1986. Uh, the DPW has been routinely checking this bridge and the adjacent culvert re regularly. The need for its replacement in the future was evident. The DPW had applied for state grants to help with the design several times. In September, the DPW were. Uh, we're getting reports that there seemed to be new issues with the bridge. A new pothole had developed on the eastern side of the bridge where the bridge deck and the roadway meet at the eastern abutment. Further inspection at that time revealed a significant two to three inch deflection in the bridge deck as vehicles passed over the bridge. The DPW did a quick inspection of the bridge, bridge beam and found significantly more corrosion than was noted previously. The DPW requested an inspection by the Mass Department of Transportation Bridge Inspection Team. The team confirmed the findings that the town had found and, and concurred that with the recommendation to close the bridge. Upon closing the bridge, the DPW developed two courses of action to address the bridge based on the project requiring only town approval and acquiring the required environmental permits. At that time, it was expected that the bridge would be replaced with box culverts in a three-month window. Shortly after starting this process, the town learned that the replacement structure was subject to the requirements of Mass General Laws Chapter 85, Section 35, 
which states that no bridge on a public highway having a span in excess of 10 feet, except a bridge constructed under the provisions of chapter 159, shall be constructed or reconstructed by any county or town except in accordance with plans and specifications, therefore approved by the department, meaning the Department of Transportation. Um, using this information, the DPW contacted our engineers for a preliminary scope of work to get the project moving a project estimate and a timeline, timeline to complete the task in accordance with the Mass Department of Transportation requirements. Uh, CDM Smith has provided the schedule which you have in your hands. Um, if started on November 1, 2018, uh, the bridge would expect to be completed and open for use in August of 2020, which is 22 months. It's an extremely long time. Um, the estimated cost of the project um, just I, you know, from knowledgeable sources, but not bid in any way, is about $2.6 million. Um, we will, of course, be f applying to the state for small bridge funding to complete this task. Um, this is significantly different than what we had, when I first told you about it. We thought it was going to be several months, which I thought was a really long time to begin with. They had, this DPW had actually gone out and secured a very creative solution where they could just buy a bridge and install it and it was going to actually work. But now that it has to go through this very rigorous environmental and Department of Transportation process, um, it's going to be a long time before that bridge is allowed to be opened again and before it's replaced. So this came in this afternoon and I'm sharing it live with you right now. And we will be communicating this out to the public beginning tomorrow. Yeah, it's like the frowny face press release. Just, <laughs> it's not a happy no, exclamation a, point no. one. Um, which does beg the question, how we didn't know this and how many more of these we have. And so is there some sort of, I mean, clearly we keep lists of the bridges in town. Luckily we don't personally, but somebody does professionally. And so can it be verified that you know, obviously this bridge, we didn't know it was subject to these classifications. Are there any other ones like that? And can we get somebody on that to find that out so yep. that we don't end up in the same position? Because it's certainly one of the things that comes up, particularly in the smaller municipalities all the time, right? Bridges, this, this, this would break a smaller community in terms of trying to suddenly come up with $2.6 million. Um, and hopefully we will get some state funding, but to not even know that we don't have the option of doing it ourselves, I think is worth knowing because then we can put its useful life out into our other, I mean, we must be planning for it somehow, I'm, I'm saying thoughtfully, that these bridges are old. We knew that eventually that bridge was going to have problems. And so if we're not in any way knowing even which program it falls under, it's just kind of, Are there other questions for the manager relative to his report? So I guess I would look for guidance from members of the board how best, I mean, we can talk to the Amherst Woods Homeowners Association. They have a very active email list. We'll talk to, make it public, obviously. Um, and uh, interestingly, some people are grateful for the bridge being closed. The people who happen to live on Station Road that cut down on their traffic remarkably, but most of the town, I think this is a burden, and uh, I, you know, it's just going to be a long time without that bridge. Ms. Kruger. Maybe there could be like a, you know, informational session. Mm -hmm. um, this is not just Amherst Woods. I mean, you know, my two street neighborhood has its own, but a lot of people use that to get from wherever, even Belchertown, to Hampshire College. Um, to anything in South Amherst, so maybe there could be something a little more widely, you know, come to Munson Library or someplace in that, which is pretty close to the offending bridge. Um, can't so get everyone, there. Yeah, right. you can't get you have to have one on one oh, side, one no, on the no, other, no. right? There's, 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 a, there's a workaround. Everyone, yeah. you know, just, I've already repatterned my uh, mm -hmm. driving muscles. Um. I was with Ms. Brewer at an event uh, 
There was uh, people living along Station Road just this very evening, and uh, they complained about the bridge, and uh, I said that I would try and find out what was going on, and if I found anything out, I would send an email to the one person who apparently had the email list and invited everybody to this event, so I'll give you that name later. Well, I'll send, I'll send this email, I'll send this out to you tonight so you have it in your mm -hmm. box and I can send it to whoever you want me to. I'll, I'll get, tell yeah. you as soon as, right. uh, when we're it, adjourned. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's really helpful because I already heard these rumors like, we need to tell the town to do X, and it's like, well, it's not just our bridge anymore. Right, and so because uh, Hopbrook is a um, important resource for the town, there's also all kinds of environmental stuff you have to measure downstream mm -hmm. flow upstream flow mm -hmm. and then flow farther upstream and you have to do that multiple times over periods of time so it's a fairly rigorous um, environmental process because this is a culvert in essence where the hot brook flows through and we were out there i mean i was out there a couple <coughs> times but when when it was really high and there's a lot of flow water flowing through there oh and, yeah <laughs> uh, it's also an opportunity to correct the road in some ways because the road is a little bit ajar or, or, it, at that location. When is a jar. it a jar? A skew, I'll say a skew, yeah. Right. Right. A, a question associated with town manager report. Um, with page five, North Amherst Library. Mm -hmm. We have an update. It's what it says here is selected to do the design work, sign the contract, and it's completed its work. Yeah, I have not seen the completed work yet. Um, So I, I just don't have a comment on that. Maybe our next meeting. Update. Other questions? The other is in regards to State Street and Puffer's Pond. It's my understanding that we've already um, submitted the public, the legal notice for the public hearing on October 29th. And so that that people know that not only are we having these walking tours, which you pointed out, where, which are There's incredibly important, mm -hmm. but it'll be on our agenda next week to talk about preparing for that public hearing, and then there'll sure. actually be a public yeah, hearing. So as we continue to keep telling people all these things to all these email lists, I know I sent the District One Neighborhood Association the flyer um, that had come out and the, the news announcement and encouraged them all to subscribe to the news announcements so that they would get it directly. Um, but for, for the State Street as well, we, I have commented in the past that we've been unaware of upcoming public hearings. So now you are aware that there's an upcoming public hearing on the 29th. Other questions for the manager? If not, then we can move on to member reports. Are there, are there member reports? I have one thing, but. Does anyone have anything from a member report standpoint? <coughs> I'll just, um, I just, I, think I talked about this earlier, but we um, have a group um, of staff and myself representing the select board reviewing proposals for recreational marijuana establishments. So just to let you know, kind of timing wise, um, there's a couple more interviews this week and then um, at the second one and I think it's the 18th then we have time carved out to discuss all all of them and make recommendation to the manager so we're just recommending however many zero to um, five to the manager so that you'll be hearing more in the next couple of weeks. So they're just so people know there is something happening around moving those along and then they would be potentially negotiating host community agreements with, with Amherst for however, however many. And then there'll probably be a second round of um, proposals invited maybe in around six months, or at least that's the concept that we had. It, it won't be this group, but or it won't be me representing, but, um, so theoretically, somebody wasn't up to snuff could could come back, having addressed certain things or whatever. So that's just a quick update. Cause it's like the main thing I've been meeting with people about. 
I was just going to ask that, and, and I know this is a whole other level of, res of additional work, but um, that we get at the end of that a written report that says, you know, met with these five people, these five groups, companies, yeah. uh, you know, it just kind of goes with all that data we've collected in terms of all that information about what we were considering, and so you don't have to rehash the entire process because we have that process written down, but just to show, okay, we did it the first time, and these are the six groups we met with, and these are the ones that got recommended. I mean, I think there should be some form of written report rather than just verbal report. I'm not saying you have to write it, Ms. Kruger, but... Um, and then, of course, negotiations, even if you told them to sign 12, that might not be that you could negotiate 12 because they wouldn't be agreeable, so. Right, whatever. Um, but it, since we spent so much time on that, I mean, it's part of the evolving, um, you know, legalization of marijuana and town of Amherst uh, response. So I just, that's, you know, for, sometimes it might seem like nothing's happening to people out there in the community, but it is happening. and. Um, can expect that and then they still have to apply to the state so th it's not like a fast track but um, it is happening it is going to come are there other member reports so I have a couple of things to uh, to share uh, so Saturday morning I did I did have the the, the privilege to uh, sort of give some welcome or opening remarks to the students that were slightly sleepy, but prepared to go out in the rain and, and do a bunch of service projects. They did several within Amherst proper, but they also went, uh, some went to Springfield, some went to Holyoke, uh, some went to, um, not Holyoke, uh, but Northampton, Hadley, a number of communities within the area that they reached out to and did various service projects. And and so, yeah, I had a nice chat with some of the folks uh, that do the organizing of it. You know, the idea for them is to try to encourage, um, you know, uh, Public service and volunteerism, and you know, sort of make the, you know students aware of you know it's it's not always a huge commitment. Sometimes it's a simple one day thing, and and so uh, it was a great opportunity, kind of a learning opportunity for them. And and uh, many of the many of the organizations that were involved were, were uh, fraternities and sororities, and they have a component of, of public service that's a part of their their charters. And so they were satisfying that. But it was a great opportunity to kind of see the the university in a, in and the students in particular, you know. Um, you know, integrating in our community, as I said to them, that you know, they're all members of our community, and how active they choose to be is is dependent upon them. And this is a way in which they can be very active members and 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 have a significant impact in a positive way in our community. So, it was nice to see that. Um, I reported earlier on PVTA stuff. Uh, again, like I said, tomorrow I'll be down in in Springfield. I'll touch base on those couple of things that that you guys asked me about, but also. Um, it's the uh, annual review process for the administrator, so we're in the thick of that. That's the real reason, I'm, or the primary reason I was going down there tomorrow. Um, the uh, Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust had a meeting last week. I could not attend, so I'm not sure what all actually transpired, but they were certainly talking about in some detail some, some uh, concepts relative to the East Street School property. Um, but the other thing I'll mention is that they're going to do another uh, housing Forum November 1st, so I want to encourage you guys to come to that or the community at large to come to that and, and uh, participate in that. So that'll be the, the 1st of November, and I believe the location of that might be the Middle School Auditorium. I'm not sure where the, they were going to do it here, but I'm not sure if we can promise this I think one. they, I, I shouldn't say, I don't know. I've, I've seen it and I can't recall now. Um, I think those were the things I needed to report on as far as um, uh, things I've been up to in that regard. Yes. I just want to mention two things. Uh, Thursday at 5 p.m. is the four boards meeting. Mm -hmm. So that's our, you know, our pretty standard presentation. Um, then next Monday, the special start of the select board meeting is at 6 p.m. And we will have a room set up. Actually, now at these walls here, I'm not sure how we're going to have the room set up. <laughs> but the school committee will be meeting in jointly with the, the select board, separate, two separate meetings, but both of you will have noti noticed meetings. Um, and you'll both be, and we might take a break or something. It's a pretty tight agenda that night because we have three public hearings scheduled um, at 6.45, 7, and 7.15. Um, so it's a heavy night next Monday, so come early and stay late. <laughs> <laughs> 
Speaking of that, I'll just to oh. reiterate about Thursday, it's a five o'clock start for the four boards yeah. meeting. So it's 5 p.m. And we're, the reason we're starting at 6 p.m. is because we're going to be hearing from the, the Donahue Institute study of um, students who live in campus housing but, but attend Amherst Elementary Schools. So there's, there's the Donahue Institute has been hired by the university to do an analysis of this uh, population. And this will be our first opportunity for them to make a presentation on it. And just to follow up on that a little bit, since I was at agenda setting, there will be a copy of the appropriate page from the strategic partnership agreement that's been saying that we were going to do this for a long time. And that there will also be, of course, the report from the Donahue Institute. And then the idea, again, physically, I'm not quite sure what we'll end up doing, given how things are Monday night. But the plan was, since this is the school committee's only presentation of this information as well so it's all being done here which lucky for us we're not having to travel there in fact are going to travel and go have a meeting is my understanding after they leave us and so we are going to have time the idea being because i believe mr slaughter intends to hand this over to me um monday is that there will be time for select board members and school committee members to ask questions of the donahue institute but there will likely not be time for public comment or questions about that item, then there will be a separate public comment process that won't take place. You know, just because we're starting at six, we're not gonna start with public comment at six. The public comment will be later, so it'll be more like the normal time, depending on how the hearings work and everything like that. But at this point, the six o'clock is for us and the school committee, because it's gonna be tight. And then we'll just encourage any audience members to reach out directly to the school committee with questions or to us or to Mr. Bachelman. Are there any other member reports? If not, then I think uh, we've covered the items on our agenda, and so I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Any further discussion, I doubt. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Aye, and we're adjourned at 9.56 p.m.